Well, good afternoon, everyone. I see that people are dressed appropriately for the little shift in the weather that we've had here lately, but it is just awesome to see everyone's smiling faces on this day that we are celebrating the collapse of communism. Again, good afternoon. I'm Angela Saylor. I'm the vice president of the Fulner Institute here at the Heritage Foundation. And it is, again, my honor to welcome you to this incredible program that we have planned uh, and to welcome all of our panelists and speakers uh, who are participating and who have partnered with us. On behalf of our new president, Dr. Kevin Roberts, uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for your interest and your work and your leadership in promoting individual liberty and economic freedom. We appreciate your leadership towards teaching the truth about the failures of communism, socialism, and Marxism, and your pursuit of justice for those striving for freedom um, under communist regimes, and your consistency in honoring the memory of the more than 100 million victims of communism. To our partners again today, uh, Ambassador Brimberg, who's the president and CEO of Victims of Communism, the VOC team and leadership, and the chairman of the board and the founder of the Heritage Foundation, Dr. Ed Fulner. We thank you so much. And to my dear colleague, Katie Gorka, who serves as the director of the Center for Civil Society here at the Heritage Foundation. And she will also serve as our moderator this afternoon for the entire program. And she has displayed incredible leadership with the team uh, in putting the program together. So thank you so much, Katie. You know, we would all agree that the ideal of freedom should never be a tale of careless accounts of truth that display misunderstanding, indifference, and uncertainty. On January 5th of 1969, then Governor Ronald Reagan warned in his inaugural address that freedom is a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation, for it comes only once to a people and those in the world who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. It would only be fitting that these words would foreshadow Reagan's challenge to Soviet leader Gorbachev to tear down these walls. Reagan, and I quote, said government is the people's business and every man, woman, and child becomes a shareholder with the first penny of tax of, of their tax paid dollars. With all the profound wording of our federal constitution, he says probably the most meaningful words are the first three, we the people. We must continue, and I'm not quoting him now, but I'm paraphrasing, to pass down to the next generation our beautiful gift of freedom and our power. Our power as the people to choose our leaders for the purpose of ensuring that structure of government never encroaches on the people's freedom or assumes a power beyond that which is, free, which is freely being granted by the people. Even though the Berlin Wall fell three decades ago, communism didn't. Today, one-fifth of the world's population still lives under single-party communist regimes in China, Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam. This sounds da daunting, but a recent heritage survey conducted to assess Americans' views on socialism and its policies, as well as young people's or young Americans' views towards socialism and its policies, should inspire us today, inspire us to keep up the good fight. Briefly, I want to share with you some of the good news, the reality of some of our challenges, and confirmation of our opportunities. The good news, overall, Americans are still positive towards both the United States and our free markets. So collectively, between those who support the terminology of free markets and capitalism, we've got 72% support. But there is a growing percentage, 29%, that support socialism. 
So what's the challenge here? The challenge is, as we looked at the survey and as you all have seen over the years, there's a vague definition of socialism and it begins to murky the waters over what we're actually talking about. So as we look at the survey that we recently did, I think it came out of the field maybe seven days ago. So it's like hot, fresh off the press here. There's the belief that the definition um, is, of socialism is essentially communism practiced in countries like Cuba and the former USSR. There's also a belief of looking at the word socialism and the concept there of communism as a significant redistribution of wealth and of ownership. And then there's the one that we, we are constantly hearing, we have to be on watch for and be super sensitive to, which is that softer kind of positive version as they defined it of equality, fairness, and working for common good. So what did that look like? The survey said that Americans are most sympathetic to a view of socialism that involves helping the poor, giving government programs and benefits, and working for the common good. Second point I wanna mention is that only, only 28% 20 of Americans believe everyone in the United States can get ahead by working hard. Only 28%. Whereby 61% believe this is only true for some people. Seeing those with disadvantaged backgrounds, minorities, and the poor is having a harder time with that principle. And then the last point I wanna make here under the challenge is that young people are evenly split about their view of wealth redistribution. Whereas other age groups lean towards not redistributing, redistributing and they are willing to pay more in taxes. So what's the confirmation of our opportunities? And I'm excited because I think the data is instructional in spotlighting the opportunity we have to continue to fight for freedom and to defend freedom for the next generation and those to come. So we must continue to dispel the myths of social, uh, socialism as our distinguished fellow in conservative thought, Dr. Lee Edwards, and his dedication to doing so through his scholarship day in and day out. We must be steadfast in promoting the United States as a commercial republic. American capitalism is based on our natural rights to life, liberty, and property. And it is nourished by the rule of law and the freedom to trade freely within and outside America's borders. It has truly built, has been built from the bottom up on practical wisdom and experience of generations. And the result is our system of democratic capitalism that has lifted millions of people out of poverty for over 200 years. Today, as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union, let us reflect on our ability to be bold like President Reagan and stand before our present day um, Breton, Bratton, Brattenburg Gates, professing freedom and liberty. We are delighted to welcome the scholars and experts that are gathered here to discuss why the Soviet Union was evil, why it collapsed, and why the allure of socialism persists today and explore how best to share these lessons with today's youth. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Katie Gorka to the podium. I am Katie Gorka, director for the Center for Civil Society and the American Dialogue at the Heritage Foundation. So I'm actually very passionate about this subject. Um, in 1989, just before the Berlin Wall fell, I really knew nothing about socialism. And I really would also say I, I don't think I would have considered myself a patriot. I don't think I really understood my own country and what it was. But when the wall fell, I became very intrigued by what was happening, and I thought, I need to go see that firsthand. Something momentous is happening over there. And so in 1990, I started traveling to Central and Eastern Europe, and it became really just the central part of my life, really. I ended up 
spending 18 years living and working in Central and Eastern Europe. I spent 12 years full time in Budapest. And even in the beginning, when I started interviewing people about the transition from communism, and I heard their stories, even then, I think the enormity of it and, and the evil of what they had lived through didn't really hit home. It didn't fully hit home until about five years into my experience, and we were living in a village outside of Budapest, and my children, our children were in school, and I started to see how much the people were still scarred, even then, by their experience. The way people would just automatically speak in a hushed voice because they were so afraid of being overheard. And it really helped me to understand just how evil communism is and how difficult it is for a country to recover from it. So I'm so pleased to be here at Heritage where I have fellow fighters and people who are equally passionate about this. And I'm so grateful for the partnership of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which works to educate our young people about the evils of communism. So I'm very happy to be here, happy to have you all here, and very grateful especially to our speakers for coming in today. So we're gonna start our program with just a short introductory video from one of my favorite historians of the period, John O'Sullivan. <clears throat> John O'Sullivan. Uh, John served as a senior policy writer and speech writer for Margaret Thatcher. And based in large part on the insights that he gained from that experience, he wrote what I consider to be one of the most entertaining histories of the collapse of the, cold, the collapse of communism and the end of the Cold War, <clears throat> called "The Pope, the President, and the Prime Minister: Three Who Changed the World." And if you haven't read it, I commend it to you. In this video message, uh, John is coming to us from Budapest, where he lives now and serves as president of the Danube Institute. Distinguished guests, fellow freedom activists, I'm sorry not to be with you to enjoy an impressive program of speakers, and I congratulate the organizers on the event, which I think deserves to be seen worldwide. But you do have a difficult task before you. You have to explain a mystery, how the Soviet communist system that had 70 years of unchecked power to realize its policies, but which collapsed ignominiously in an economic and moral wasteland, still has supporters around the world, and in particular, in the United States. I'm going to cite just one among many from communism's elite admirers. I quote, the Soviet leaders changed Russia from a backward peasant autocracy despised by the West into a technological giant of whom the world cowered in fear for half a century. Well, Russia was already a fast industrializing economy prior to the First World War, the fifth largest economy in the world, in fact. 70 years later, the Soviet Union was a massive economic failure to the point where Gorbachev complained to the Politburo that it exported less annually than Singapore. Technically, it lagged in every field except the military, where a massive concentration of capital and research amounting to about 25% of GDP ensured that an otherwise backward economy could match the US in nuclear and rocket technology. But the cost of that military spending was borne by Russian consumers, starved of everyday goods, and by Russian industry and agriculture, starved of capital resources and modern management. The result was an economic wasteland before which not even its satellites cowered. Economically speaking, no capitalist country achieved as little as the USSR for so much human and material input. Nor did the USSR compensate for these failures by making greater social gains than under capitalism. Doctors had to be bribed. Patients had to take bandages and medicines into hospital with them. Homelessness in Moscow was reduced by an internal passport system that kept people out of the city. Was the Soviet Union then a more idealistic society that gave its people more than empty consumerism? 
on the contrary. Its constant shortages made people obsessed with material goods to the point that a girl would sell herself for a pair of Western jeans. And of course, there were the purges, the genocide, and the gulag. As Hayek wrote, the last resort of the competitive economy is the bailiff, but the ultimate sanction of a planned economy is the hangman. Mass graves were found across the Soviet Union, some containing as many as 300,000 corpses after communism's collapse. One was in Moscow itself. The politics of murder continued almost to the end. It happened because communism, as James Burnham said, was a parasitic system in which the parasites seized nations, consumed their resources, and drove them into the ground until agricultural countries had to import food to feed their people. Their system of political oppression failed because their system of economic irrationality destroyed every nation that was the parasite's host one after the other. I don't know how to explain the continuing support and nostalgia on the left for this system, admittedly in the soft totalitarian form of wokeness. But as Marx might say, socialism repeats itself, the first time as genocide, the second time as therapy. Thank you. All right, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Alan Charles Coors is the Henry Charles Lee Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Pennsylvania, where he taught the intellectual history of the 17th and 18th centuries. In 2005, at the White House, he received the National Humanities Medal for, quote, his study of European intellectual thought and his dedication to the study of the humanities. A widely respected teacher, he is the champion of academic freedom. He co-founded and served as chairman of the board of directors of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Most of us know it as FIRE one of the country's seminal institutions fighting for academic freedom. Dr. Coors, can I welcome you to the podium? It's a great privilege to be here today. <clears throat> the victims of communism were not the thousands of the Inquisition, the thousands of American lynching, nor even by far the six million dead from Nazi extermination. The best scholarship yields numbers that the mind must struggle to comprehend. Scores and scores and scores and scores of millions of individual bodies. Alexander Yakovlev Gorbachev's right-hand man in the final Politburo examined the archives for the last Soviet leader and came away a deeply changed and scarred man. <clears throat> he let us know that 60 million were slain in the Soviet Union alone. The Chinese author Yong Chang and her historian husband had access to scores of Mao Zedong's collaborators and to the detailed Russian archives on Mao. In Mao, the unknown story, they reached the figure of 70 million individual human lives snuffed out by Mao's deliberate choices. If we count those dead of starvation from the communist desire and ability to experiment with human interactions in agriculture, we may add 30 million to 40 million in three years of China alone. See the work of Frank de Cutter, see the work of Yang Yishong. The communist Khmer Rouge in China, excuse me, the communist Khmer Rouge under a Pol Pot educated in Paris in his politics by French communist intellectuals slaughtered one-fifth to one-fourth of the entire Cambodian population in each and every regime 
shot, dead by deliberate exposure, starved, murdered in work camps and prisons, meant to extract every last fiber of labor and then kill them. What might have one expected when the Iron Curtain fell? What didn't occur? What was the dog that did not bark in the night? Where were the celebrations? Where were the accountings? Our schools, universities, and media do not teach our children any differently now about the human consequences of individual liberty and divided power in the real world. Our children do not know what happened under communism in any domain. Those who depend on our media and our films do not know. Our culture lives on without self-belief, belief in liberty, or any moral understanding of our extraordinary place in the dignity and improvement of mankind. I am honored to be among individuals and organizations here that work to change that moral catastrophe. The communist Holocaust, like the Nazi, should have brought forth a flowering of Western art and witness and sympathy and an ocean of tears. Instead, it has called forth a glacier of indifference. Kids who in the 1960s had portraits of Mao and Che on their college walls, the exact moral equivalent of having hung portraits of Hitler and Goebbels on their walls, came to teach our children about the moral superiority of their generation. It is precisely because the lessons that would be taught by knowledge that no revision of the curriculum occurs. It is because of those lessons that they are not taught. For at least a generation, intellectual contempt for liberal society has been at the core of the humanities and the soft social sciences. This has accelerated, not changed, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, and our children do not know about the victims, the slaughter, the Everest of bodies. Ask, as I did for 50 years, ask freshmen at universities how many died under Stalin's regime. They will answer thousands, tens of thousands. It's the equivalent of saying Hitler killed scores or hundreds of Jews. As for the mea culpas, we await them in vain. When General Eisenhower heard that the German residents of a nearby city didn't know about a death camp whose stench should have reached their nostrils, he marched them, well-dressed, through the rotting corpses and made them help dispose of the dead. The mayor of Saxe-Gotha and his wife hanged themselves on their return. We lack Eisenhower's authority. Milan Kundera, the great Czech novelist, stated the moral reality with clarity. What about those with good intentions, he asked. Kundera wrote, quote, when Oedipus realized that he himself was the cause of their suffering, he put out his eyes and wandered blind away from Thebes, unable to stand the sight of the misfortune he had wrought by not knowing, he put out his eyes and wandered blind away from Thebes." End quote. Let the apologists for communism acknowledge the dead, bury the dead, and atone for the dead. 
Otherwise, let them be forgiven only when they have wandered blind away from Thebes. Let Western intellectuals learn the words of Requiem, written during the Stalinist terror by Anna Akhmatova, the great Russian poet of the 20th century. Quote, I will remember them always and everywhere. I will never forget them, no matter what comes. Close quote. The bodies demand accounting, apology, and repentance. Without such things, the age of communism lives. Without such things, there remains a Berlin Wall of the mind and spirit that has not fallen. Our public schools and most of our private schools teach almost nothing about this. It is not their narrative. We must change that. Schools, curriculum, if those who believe in freedom continue to permit their children to be taught by those who don't know, they truly have only themselves to blame. May the work of those here prosper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Coors. If I could invite our panelists to come up to the podium. And what I'd like to do is I'll just go ahead and int introduce them now and then each one will, will make some opening remarks and we'll have a bit of a discussion. So let me start with Dr. Lee Edwards. <clears throat> Lee Edwards is our inspiration and our wise man here at Heritage. He is a leading historian of American conservatism with books on Reagan, Goldwater, Buckley, and Ed Meese, as well as histories of the American conservative movement and the Heritage Foundation. Lee is also the founder of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which hopefully you recognize by now, plays a central role in keeping alive the lessons of communism. He continues to write prolifically, so I encourage you to check his page at the Her Heritage Foundation and to follow him. After Lee, we'll hear from David Satter, who is a journalist and historian and one of the most incisive observers of Russia and the former Soviet Union. He is a member of the Victim of Communism's Academic Council, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and a fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Sebastian Gorka is the host of the national radio show, America First with Sebastian Gorka, as well as host of a show at Newsmax, the Gorka Reality Check. He held the Major General Matthew C. Horner Chair of Military Theory at National Defense University, and he has lectured extensively to American military, law enforcement, and intelligence. He also previously served as Deputy Assistant to the President for Strategy. So Lee, if I could ask you, do you want to speak from the podium, correct? You prefer to speak from here? Yes, and I'll let each of you can decide whether to speak from there or from the podium, but Lee, welcome. <clears throat> so thank you, Katie, and uh, welcome everyone to this special look at the collapse of the Soviet Union some 30 years ago and why, why it happened. Before proceeding with some remarks which I have put down, I would just like to say that I am honored uh, to be associated with Alan Kors. Uh, this, this gentleman and his eloquence and his ability to talk about the victims and the crimes of communism is unparalleled not only in America but around the world. 
and we're, we're so grateful at the Victims of Communism Memorial that we have him, <clears throat> that we can rely upon him <clears throat> to articulate why communism was the greatest and the most deadly ism of the 20th century and why it still persists today. So I'd like to explore with you, if I may, <clears throat> this question of why did this tyranny, which controlled dozens of nations and was responsible for the deaths of more than 100 million victims, actually probably closer to 200 million victims uh, during the 20th century, collapsed almost overnight. In just two years, you think back on it, from 1989 to 1991, the Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet Union disintegrated, and Marxism-Leninism was dumped on the ash heap of history. Why did a system that appeared to be so militarily and economically strong implode so quickly? Inevitable correlation of forces, the result of a policy of containment that the United States and the West had followed for nearly 40 years? Or was it because one national leader, Ronald Reagan, adopted a policy of ending the Cold War through victory. <clears throat> well, what do the experts say? So I did a little research. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former national security advisor to President Carter, argued that Marxism-Leninism was an alien doctrine imposed by an imperial power culturally repugnant to the peoples of Eastern Europe Richard Pipes, the Harvard historian, said that there were incidental causes of the Soviet Union's dissolution, like the invasion of Afghanistan, as well as more profound levels of causation, like economic stagnation. But the decisive catalyst, said Professor Pipes, was the coercive nature of communism's objectives. Well, what about Martin Malia? out there at UC Berkeley, very distinguished, another distinguished historian. He said, Marxism, Marxism was the central factor in the collapse of communism. It was the perverse genius of Marxism, said Malia, to present an unattainable utopia as an infallibly scientific enterprise. Michael Novak, that great social philosopher, said, well, communism set out to destroy the human capital on which a free economy and a polity are based, and in so dealing, sowed the seeds of its own destruction. What about economics? What about the, the way that uh, things were produced and sold here in the Soviet Union. Well, Soviet economics, according to Andrei Breshke, was fatally flawed from the beginning. Why? Because replacing private property rights with state ownership gave rise to a huge class of functionaries committed only to preserving their domains and pleasing their political bosses. I would add, that when communist leaders admitted they no longer believed in communism, they destroyed the glue of ideology that had maintained their facade of power and authority. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn himself said that you can only understand the crimes and the victims of communism if you understand the role of ideology and how important that was in Soviet communism. So, really, far from being a fortress, Eastern Europe had become a Potemkin village, easily penetrated by electronic messages of democracy and capitalism from the West. Which brings us to that messenger extraordinaire, Ronald Reagan. The Reagan Doctrine was what he gave to us in our battle against communism. 
And the Reagan doctrine was based on a deceptively simple approach to ending the Cold War. And Ronald Reagan said, well, we win, they lose. We win, they lose. But no president had heretofore sought a policy of victory, had been able to sum up this battle of the Cold War in those four short words. The Reagan Doctrine, in fact, was a highly sophisticated, multifaceted offensive that included covert and other support to solidarity in Poland, a psychological operation to engender indecision and fear among Soviet leaders, a global campaign to reduce Soviet access to Western technology, and a drive to cripple the Soviet economy by dri driving down the price of oil and natural gas imports to the West. Another important part of the Reagan doctrine was the overt support of anti-communist forces in Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Angola, and Cambodia. Now, the neoconservative columnist Charles Krauthammer often credited with inventing the Reagan doctrine, but it was, in fact, far more complex, far more subtle than he and other pundits realized. Take, for example, Reagan's rhetorical offensive against Moscow, based on intelligence reports and his lifelong support and study of communism, Reagan concluded that Soviet communism was cracking and was ready to crumble. And he first went public with his prognosis of the Soviet Union's systemic weakness in May of 1982, seven years before the wall came down. Reagan declared that the Soviet empire was, quote, faltering because rigid centralized control has destroyed incentives for innovation and individual achievement. One month later, in a prophetic address to members of the British Parliament, Reagan said that the Soviet Union was gripped by a great revolutionary crisis and that, quote, a global campaign for freedom would ultimately prevail. He predicted that the march of freedom and democracy will leave Marxism-Leninism on the ash heap of history as it has left other tyrannies that stifle the freedom and muz muzzle the self-expression of the people. Now, the New York Times, of course, scoffed, but ministers and members of the Soviet Politburo shivered. They knew what and they could see what was coming. A year later, before a conference of evangelical ministers, Reagan said that the West should recognize that the Soviets are the focus of evil in the modern world and the masters of an evil empire. It was a compelling example of what Vaclav Havel called the power of words to change history. Far off, in the dissident gulag, Natan Sharansky saw the phrase evil empire in a Soviet newspaper and tapped out a message to fellow prisoners in the gulag that at last the West had a leader who understood the Soviet Union. That's not all. Deliberately and specifically and carefully, at his direction, the National Security Council drew up a series of national security decision directives that outlined a strategy of victory. 32 declared the U.S. would seek to neutralize Soviet control over Eastern Europe. Number 66 stated it was U.S. policy to disrupt the Soviet economy by attacking a, so a strategic triad of financial credits, high technology, and natural gas. 75 stated that the U.S. would no longer coexist with the Soviet system, but seek to change it fundamentally. 
Finally, Reagan had long favored an alternative to the policy of mutual assured destruction, MAD as we know it, under which the US and the Soviet Union retain the nuclear capability to retaliate and destroy the other in the event of a nuclear attack. And so in March of 1983, President Reagan announced the development and deployment of an anti-ballistic missile system would be his top defense priority, his ultimate goal. He kept his word. Rejecting all Soviet attempts to limit the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, now opponents ridiculed SDI as Star Wars, but the Soviets believed that the U.S. had the technical ability to build it. Reagan took his freedom offensive into the heart of the disintegrating Soviet empire, standing before the Brandenburg Gate in June of 1987. He directly challenged the Kremlin, saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Two years later, the wall was gone. Yes, the statesman who wrote Finney to the Cold War was Ronald Reagan who came into office with a clear set of ideas he had developed over a lifetime. He forced the Soviet Union to abandon the goal of world communism. How? By challenging its legitimacy, regaining superiority in military strength, and using human rights as a powerful psychological weapon. Reagan had such self-confidence, once the Cold War was over, to commend Gorbachev for admitting that communism was not working and introducing the beginnings of democracy, individual freedom, and free enterprise into the Soviet system. But Gorbachev was never able, once the Cold War was over, to really to understand what would result in the way of forces from the collapse of the Soviet system. Lech Walesa founder of the Solidarity Trade Union Movement that brought down communism in Poland and prepared the way for the end of communism in Eastern Europe, summed up Reagan with these words. We in Poland owe him our liberty. So do the tens of millions behind the Iron Curtain who were caught up in the largest and most destructive conflict in human history the Cold War. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to first of all apologize for my voice. Uh, it's a little bit hoarse, but I, I'll try to be understandable. I uh, spent a great deal of time in the Soviet Union. I lived there for six years. I think I'm one of a handful of people who actually know the country from the inside and experienced a lot of what happened historically. Uh, the thing that, that foreigners, and I include Americans, uh, uh, often don't get about communism, about Marxism, about the Soviet Union, is that the Soviet Union was based not on an economic system in the first instance, but rather on a false religion. It was the ideology, Marxism, Leninism, which claimed to be a perfect science, denied religion, denied this, the, the spiritual nature of the human personality, which was the basis for that system. And it was Marxism, Leninism that accounted for the atrocities. Uh, in fact, you don't kill 100 million people in order to establish universal health care. You, 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 you carry out mass killings in order uh, to impose an, a completely new and, as it turns out, alien conception of reality. Western civilization owes its roots ultimately to two documents, the Ten Commandments and the, the parable of the cave in Plato, because they established two things. The notion that 
uh, that the truth is uh, that that the world of society uh, achieves its legitimacy from a transcendent source, and that there's a set of moral rules that apply universally in all situations and to all people. Those principles were denied by Marxism, which imposed instead a kind of pseudoscience on a helpless population imposed by fanatics, but, but, but established with the help of unlimited terror. Soviet Union appeared impregnable uh, right up until the eve of the reforms which led to its rapid collapse. The, there were really three important reasons why the Soviet leaders did the one thing they could not afford possibly to do, which was to challenge the, to, to allow a challenge to the legitimacy of the ideology. The first of these was uh, an event that took place in 1982 over the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon when Israeli planes downed 81, using new uh, computer technology, downed 81 Syrian planes ma ma of Soviet manufacture without losing a single plane. The second was pressure that began to build up on the part of semi-westernized advisors inside the Soviet apparatus who had been influenced to a degree by the dissident movement and who held out the idea that what is possible, that it would be possible to reform communism without losing power. And finally, President Reagan's strategic defense initiative. Those factors convinced the Soviet leadership to take the risk of reform. At first, those reforms were extremely heavy handed. They consisted of a policy that was called in Russian, uskarenia, which means acceleration. The idea that you could use the same institutions and force people to work harder. It, of course, didn't work. Uh, and finally, uh, Gorbachev uh, was pushed or persuaded to take the risk of real liberalization. But in the Soviet system, you have to understand that Gorbachev himself was not in a position to tell a local leader what to do. There was an entire bureaucratic apparatus that had to be motivated to carry out the orders of those who were ultimately in power, the members of the Politburo, and they refused to do it. They sabotaged the first proposals for reform and did everything possible to frustrate changes which would have resulted in the loss of power for them. It was at that point that Gorbachev made a fatal decision which was to inaugurate the policy of Glasnost. Glasnost meant that for the first time in the Soviet Union, it was possible to speak the truth. Give you an example of some of the things that began to appear in Soviet newspapers and that were simply hair-raising for the Soviet citizens. Uh, an article appeared saying how many hours Soviet citizens spend in queues, you, something you could never mention before. Uh, it, the, uh, another article started talking about prostitution, and uh, it was common in the Soviet Union, given the R Russian uh, tendencies, for, for people to say, do you see where Gorbachev's Glasnost has taken us? Now we have prostitution. <laughs> the idea, of course, was prostitution before. I just didn't talk about it. In any case, what happened was that a space for truth was opened up in a, in a system which was based entirely on lies because the Soviet ideology conflicted with reality and it, and it, 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 didn't, it didn't admit its falsity, but on the contrary, set about creating an entire array of false institutions which, and, and, and um, uh, a, <coughs> a charade of democratic government that Russian citizens and Soviet citizens were forced uh, on, pain, on pain of repression to act out as if it was true. This is what Solzhenitsyn meant when he said, live not by lies. The, whole, the Soviet Union became a nation of actors, 
and everyone was forced to lie. Gorbachev created the, the conditions for people to begin to speak the truth. And the, the, those people who had been yearning to speak the truth for years constantly pushed out the boundaries. And Gorbachev refused to, to authorize repression because to do so would have been to admit that his original policy was wrong and to play into the hands of his opponents. Suddenly, you had a conf conflict in the Soviet Union between a space of truth and a system built on lies, and only one of those, only the truth or the system could prevail. It, they, it, they could not both win, because they were incompatible with each other. Soviet Union based, you know, the ideology had three important effects on people. It convinced the nationalities that Soviet power was the logical conclusion of the history of their particular country, whether it was Lithuania, Armenia, Uzbekistan, or Ukraine, whatever. It convinced the working class that they were a privileged class and lived better than anyone in the West. And it convinced the uh, members of the Communist Party that they were part of the vanguard of history. And as soon as the truth began to circulate in the Soviet Union, all three of those pillars became the, the hidden fault lines in the Soviet Union were undermined to the point that, that suddenly people became politically active. And at every point, it was a question of use repression, use force, carry out massacres as they had done in the past, as the Chinese did in the Tiananmen Square, <clears throat> or let the process go further. And it finally reached its culmination in 1991, 30 years ago, when a group of communist hardliners seized power and intent on reestablishing the world of lies, and 100,000 people gathered outside the White House to defend the changes that had taken place. And this is what was really critically important, and it's important to bear in mind about the fall of the Soviet Union. The members of what was called the Gekechepe, which is the State Committee on the Extraordinary Situation, had the means to, to carry out a Tiananmen Square-style massacre. They could have drowned the, the protests in blood. But they didn't do it. And the reason they didn't do it was that after six years, well, five years of glasnost, the ideology had lost its power. When they had the ideology, they were ready to kill anyone. And they were capable of killing anyone. But when, after, after those years of being exposed, at the end, Marshal Dmitry Yazov, who was the, sec the Minister of Defense was faced with the choice to send in the army, and, 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 and it would have been a terrible slaughter, uh, and kill those out in front of the White House. He, he, in a, a critical moment, he said, you know, that's it. The, the army is pulling out of the game. Uh, you know, and he gave the order to the troops to pull out of Moscow. After that, it was just a matter of time, four months but before the Soviet Union collapsed and the flag was, 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 was lowered. The reason now, and this, with this I'll conclude, why people uh, to this day are sympathetic to the, to the idea of socialism. First of all, they don't understand what it is. They, don't under, they, they confuse it with things like universal health care, uh, employment benefits, minimum wage, uh, the fact is the Soviet Union clearly defined socialism as the first stage of communism. You go from socialism, communism, and in both cases, the definition that was used for, for one-third of the population of the world was the abolition of private property. Those people who identify social welfare legislation, whether that legislation is right or wrong, whether it's smart or stupid, with socialism, are making a big mistake. Those me measures are undertook in order to reinforce capitalism. They may or may not do it, 
But when Bismarck introduced socialism in the 19th century in Germany, he did it to fight communism. And it was socialists who crushed the Paris Commune in 1870. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, if you want, but, but the use of that language, because of its confusing effect, leads people to sympathize with regimes like Bernie Sanders, who went to the Soviet Union for a camping trip, which are guilty of these mass crimes. So in any case, to, shall we understand, to teach uh, about the Soviet Union, to teach about the history of the 20th century, we have to start with a murderous ideology, uh, understand why it destroyed the mor moral person uh, in, and, and, the, and the, the, the character of the individual treated him as raw material for the, for the realization of the regime's goals, and in that way def defined him all independent agency. Once people understand that, they'll begin to understand what, what communism really was, and, what, and correspondingly, how much we have to defend in the, in the, in the West and in the United States. Right? Thanks. <clears throat> First things first, I have to recognize I find it hard to believe that I'm on the same stage with intellectual giants like Professor Coors, Dr. Lee Edwards, and um, indomitable truth tellers like David Satter. So uh, I am humbled, especially given the fact that the organizers have listed me as a radio and TV host. <laughs> I'll have to have words with them. Um, <laughs> why, why, why am I? Why am I here? The charge given to me was a very simple one. Explain why communism is evil. I could give you a nine minute exegetical analysis of Kennan's works, Nietzsche, NSC 68, but I won't. I'll tell you a very personal story that I believe is the reason why I am here and why I ended up in the White House not too long ago. For some people, it is possible to identify a moment in time when your life changes inexorably, when you arrive at a branch in the road and you have to take the certain path demonstrated to you. For me, it happened at the age of eight. I was on the beach. My parents always vacationed in France. My father was an amazing athlete on the national crew team before the secret police arrested him, loved to swim. And one day, as a careless child living in a free society, I was sitting on the sand playing with my G.I. Joes. And my father, a, a huge figure of a man who spent two years down a prison coal mine with no equipment, no machinery, just hand tools, came out of the water after his swim. And I looked at dad, and I saw something that I hadn't recognized before. I saw these white lines on his wrists, and I didn't know, I didn't make sense to me, because he, he wasn't old, he couldn't be wrinkled on his wrists. So like a foolish child, I said, hey, dad, what's that? Without dropping a beat, with no emotion, very calmly he said, son, that's where the secret police bound my wrists together with wire behind my back so they could hang me from the torture chamber ceiling. Now that is when my life changed forever. Because I understood from that moment forward it was incontrovertible, evil is real. Evil exists in the heart of man. It was no longer reserved for the bedtime stories my mother told me for J.I.R. Tolkien and evil witches in forests and mythology, it was real. So how did that shape my understanding and the rest of my life? Very simply, because I have spent the intervening 43 years fighting totalitarianism, not just in the land of my parents' birth when the wall fell, I went back at the age of 23 to become assistant to the new deputy minister for defense in the first freely elected Hungarian government. So I did my bit, and my wife too. 
in Hungary, trying to get that benighted country back into Europe. But then, after 9-11, I had an epiphany. For me, there was a connective tissue between the ideology that had led to the death of 100 million people across the globe, the ideology of Hitler, and the ideology of likes of bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. And the link was the following. They're all totalitarians. If you dare, you dare to resist them, you must be crushed. And as such, before becoming a TV and radio host, <laughs> for nigh on two decades, I threw myself in with you know, God's blessings, thank you, connecting me to some amazing people in America. And I ended up being, with my wife, the only externally accredited provider of counterterrorism training to the FBI. We trained, I am not kidding, tens of thousands of FBI agents, intelligence analysts, SOS support staff, and members of the US military, especially at Fort Bragg. And that is how I was propelled eventually by somebody called Donald Trump to end up in the White House working on counterterrorism. What has this got to do with the challenge today? The following, how we did it. What my wife and I did and why it works and why we need it more than ever. And here's the secret. Like the gentleman you've heard already today, we never, ever gave up. When we were told by the Obama administration, with an existing FBI contract on our books, when we were told by the president and his key advisors, oh, terrorism has nothing to do with ideology. Terrorism is about, quote, root causes such as poverty, like those poor hijackers on 9-11, those grad students and doctors. Yes, it's about disenfranchisement and illiteracy. We said, no. When our materials were banned in the FBI, when we were told we can't use the word jihadi when lecturing the threat of al-Qaeda, we said, really? I want to talk to the person who's banned that word in US federal training. We never, ever stepped down. We didn't allow ourselves to get to the point where we are today, where self-censorship is perhaps our biggest issue. When we bite our tongues, when somebody comes up to me at an event, a lovely event in a ball gown, wearing black tie, and says, hey, can I have a selfie? And I say, sure. And afterwards I say, hey, don't forget to tag me when you post it. And she looks at me, suddenly, completely different. Oh, I can't do that. I can't post a photograph with you because my husband's self-employed and didn't you know that Northern Virginia is very Democrat? Well, then guess what? You do not espouse the values you say you do because if you're not prepared to put your face to what you say you love, then you don't love it. It's exactly the same as my parents' generation behind the Iron Curtain. If you kept your head down just to get ahead, guess what? You were the permissive environment. You, pro uh, you actually made the gulags possible. If you did it, you resisted. And you paid the price, as my family did. So, what do we have to do? The situation is very different now. And I want to leave you with some final thoughts for the next panel and for Q&A. Our challenge, and I've used this as the case study in all my years working with the military. In 1946 to 54, we nailed it. There has never been a case of strategic threat analysis and requisite response which was as good. Why? Because Kennan and Nietzsche together with a handful of people understood the threat explained its ideological roots, and then built a system to delegitimize that ideological and existential threat. Today it looks easy, looking back. Today we have a far more difficult problem. Yes, 
Cuba's out there. Yes, North Korea. Yes, China. But the existential threat we face is here on US soil. The statistic I have quoted more than any other statistic in the last five years is the victims of Communism Memorial Foundation's joint YouGov poll, which found that more than 60% of American millennials would prefer to live in a socialist or communist America. That's why Bernie Sanders, that's why AOC, that's why Open Borders, we, we have to think very very imaginatively about what is the sources of Soviet conduct analog. What is the long telegram and what is the NSC 68 for an ideological threat that is here on our shores and in the minds of our children? That is the challenge we face because communism is still evil. Okay, so let me start with a question um, that you've all sort of touched at the answer, but I'd love to have you go a little bit deeper. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the role of the intellectual leaders. You've all talked about the political leaders, but the, the role of the intellectual leaders, the writers, um, the journalists under the Soviet system, how did they contribute from inside to its, and what does that tell us, perhaps, for the role of intellectuals today in, in resolving this culture war? Well, it was uh, Vaclav Havel, as I quoted him by saying that there's the power of words to change history. And the one example I think of uh, is the novel, novel, novella by Alexander Solzhenitsyn called one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. It's only 100 pages or more, and it is one day uh, of Ivan in the gulag in Siberia, getting up in the morning, uh, eating his breakfast with a piece of bread smaller than this, uh, then going out working 10, 12 hours, uh, <clears throat> under you know, 30 below uh, degree weather, uh, then getting back, trying to snatch up a little bit of soup for dinner, and then sleeping in his clothes and as he possibly could on a bed about as firm and unyielding as that. This novel exposed the gulag for the first time and uh, its, its impact was extraordinary. Uh, and people, I think, really began seeing, as, uh, as Sebastian said, that communism was not just an ideology, but was evil, was evil. And here was evil incarnate uh, in the gulag in Siberia. So there, you know, the, the impact of one little book and what it can do, it can change history. And so I think that what we try to do at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation is to look for individuals like that and to encourage them and to work with them as best as we can to do their, that kind of work, to do that kind of writing. And, of course, these days it's not just writing, it's also television. And I know, David, you're, you're working on a particular video coming up, which I think is going to be have a tremendous impact, is important. Uh, just, just very briefly, the, uh, what Lee is uh, referring to, I think, in a broader sense, is the Soviet dissident movement, uh, which involved, of course, Solzhenitsyn, I mean, dis dissidents in the Soviet Union, typed up in, you know, I, you know I, one day in the life of D Ivan Denisovich was allowed officially by Khrushchev as part of the anti-Stalin campaign. But, his, but the reaction was greater than he anticipated, and all further books of Solzhenitsyn were banned. But those, though, those books began to be reproduced in typewritten copies with, that were you know, copies that were typed out with the help of four and five uh, pieces of carpet paper, uh, and then circulated hand to hand. 
The, the, the dissidents uh, in 1975, when the Helsinki agreements were signed, it was the, the, the U.S. basically acceded officially to the division of Europe and to Soviet conquests in return for promises to respect human rights that the Soviets had no intention of keeping. But the dissident groups in the Soviet Union said, well, we're going to help you uh, honor those commitments. And they put the Soviet government in a very difficult position. They began producing information about repression, about torture in psychiatric hospitals, about uh, imprisonments. And then they themselves began to be arrested. And then new dissidents would write about those arrests. But the point was not so much the content, but the fact that people were not willing that there was a group of people who were ready to go to, go to prison and take all the risks in order to circulate the truth. And that affected even those people who were in the communist hierarchy, because there were liberals. Advi you know, they, they were powerless until Gar Gorbachev came, uh, came to power. But they were affected by the dissident movement. And when finally the kind of tectonic plates of the regime began to shift, there was, there was a model of free speech and democratic practice that could be adopted. And so the, 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 the ideas that had been the property of only a few people began to be mm -hmm. espoused by millions under conditions in which there was suddenly the possibility of freedom in the Soviet Union. That's what happened. As far as our country is concerned, um, we, 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 the United States, in many respects, a very superficial society, and Americans are not interested in abstract ideas. And the the communists did something very cunning; they buried the essence of what they were doing in a, in abstract philosophy, which not everybody is interested in mastering. In fact, very few people are. Uh, so, the, so, in other words, to get at the evil, you have to know the ideas. To know the ideas, you have to understand their essence. The number of people ready to do that, especially under conditions in which the big issues are climate change and transgender rights, are very, very few. So, uh, basically, I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of... The dissidents, the Soviet dissidents, were ready to confront the Soviet Union on the level of values. And that the, uh, only by explaining you know, what the conflict of values between the anti-values of communism and all totalitarianism, including Islamic fanaticism and Nazism. Com you know, totalitarianism is very simple. Ideology imposed by terror. That's all it is. And only a fictitious reality can justify absolute power. Now, if you can explain, you know, explain properly, e even a lot of Americans will, will get the idea. But that, that's our task. Um, at the risk of marital bliss, I'm going to say it's the wrong question. Um, <laughs> To go back to my philosophy classes in my first year, the, the role of the dissident authors is necessary but not sufficient. And it's far less important than what is done with those writings. So we, we don't need new analysis. I mean, just open Kersler, open Huxley, open the Black Book of Communism. We don't need more writers. We need more activist leaders. It wasn't uh, what Havel wrote. It was Havel's refusal to comply that was important. It wasn't what was being written on Samizdat in Poland that was important. It was Lech Wałęsa standing on the gates of the shipyard in Gdansk saying, I am prepared to die for Polish sovereignty and for freedom. So what, what we are missing now, we've got the homework, we've got the material. Oh, and by the way, it is fascinating. If you try to quote the 100 million deaths by communism, if you're not prepared to say, you know, Stephen Courtois, you know, 800-page book, the only mainstream reference you can get is David's article in the Wall Street Journal. It is so buried. This fact that 100 million people died, you will find one general mainstream reference to it, and it's thanks to David. So when it comes to what we have to do, 
It's how did we win? We won because of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and St. John Paul II. These weren't intellectuals giving lectures with PowerPoint slides. These are people who had no fear and connected at an emotional level with their audiences. So what we need today is the equivalent of that, people who are not prepared to back down. And then secondly, essential, non-negotiable with the millennial generation. They will not listen to you if you have facts. They are not interested. This is why Ben Shapiro is utterly wrong. Sorry, Ben, okay? I know you built your career on this, but you know, facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah, nice, but feelings is how you change a culture. Truly, it is. So the way we win this argument is what the Memorial Foundation is doing. It's what others are doing. I see Morgan Zegers in, in, the, in the audience. We need to tell the stories of oppression from the people who were oppressed. I've written three books on national security and counterterrorism. This is the last one. My wife said, hey, do you want people to read your books or only wonks in the DC circuit? So every book opens with a chapter about what? Not Al-Qaeda, <coughs> not the Brotherhood. Every book starts with a chapter about my parents and what they suffered under that totalitarian regime. Guess what? Wherever I travel the planet, if anybody's read any of my books, what do they want to talk about? They want to talk, don't want to talk about, uh, you know, do you know what ISIS's real name is? No. They want to talk about what my father experienced in that coal mine what the secret police did to him, how he escaped with a 17-year-old daughter of a fellow prison mate across a, across a minefield into free Austria. That's what they want to talk about. Why? Because since that platonic cave and the shadow, people need stories. Mm. It's how we live. We thirst for stories. That's why C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien have done more to save Western civilization than any non-fiction work has ever done. So, brave people and real stories. Well, as a matter of fact, those stories are being told yeah. and were being done by the victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. If I may be, be a little self-serving here, and that is a project which we call Witness, which are a series of video interviews of people who have lived and survived under communism. Uh, these are individuals from Eastern Europe, but also from Korea, uh, from China, and elsewhere. And what we have found is that, you're absolutely right, uh, Sebastian, that uh, the emotional impact of these people explaining what it was like to live under communism is extraordinary. Now, we're going even a step farther, and I'm going to be a little more self-promoting here, and invite all of you, both here uh, today, but also listening, and perhaps listening in the future on YouTube to come and visit when we open the museum to the victims of communism in May of next year. And uh, I think we probably could provide even someone to come on your radio show, Sebastian. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask Katie who that, that should be. <laughs> well, one thing, if I may just add, what is important when it comes to writers and which is a massive chasm in, in, in our knowledge, is we don't understand how they did it here in America. People think this is Obama and, and Hillary. No, it is 90 years. It, it is from, uh, it is from you know, Scritti Politi in, in, in Italian jail, uh, from Gramsci, all the way through Marcuse, Adorno, Alinsky, and up. We need to understand how they did it because this was a slow boil and they are profiting after 80 years of hard work. All right, I'm sorry we have to tear ourselves away. I don't want this to end. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Panelists to come up. Come on. <laughs> Thanks.
quickly introduce Mike. Quickly. Um, I can't do it quickly because I can't find my notes. Sorry. Do I, this is, this is, this is quick. Yeah, but I can't do it all from, from memory. Here we go. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay, Mike Gonzalez is the Angeles T. Arredondo E. Pluribus Unum Senior Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He spent close to 20 years as a journalist, much of that time spent at the Wall Street Journal. He left journalism to join the administration of President George W. Bush as a speechwriter. His most recent books are The Plot to Change America, How Identity Politics is Dividing the Land of the Free, and BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. So Mike will be our moderator. Thank you. And I, uh, I do have some, uh, it's so, so great to see so many of you, by the way, people that I know through social media, people have met for years, Vladko, so many people here from the former captive uh, countries and, and, and Suarez. I'm sorry, it's from a, from a, a currently captive country. <clears throat> Look, I've been talking to Katie a lot about this anniversary, and I think, of course, this this very, very good reason to celebrate the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, but I, I do want to sound a, a note that I think Seb alluded to this in his remarks, and that is that uh, it, is, it, it is an irony to me that as we celebrate this 30th anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union, we really are contending with Marxism in, in, in ways that we haven't uh, often in the past. And this time I think it's, it's more dangerous, it's more pernicious, and that is because it is a, uh, it is a, a, a mutant of Marxism. I'm talking about the Gramscian Marxism that we're facing in this country. And for those of you, I try, tend to assume no knowledge because I think when I, I assume too much knowledge then people say, well, you started the conversation in the middle of the conversation. So Antonio Gramsci <coughs> was the founder of Italy's Communist Party, and, and he, you know, Mussolini put him in prison, and, and he, he was very concerned, very upset that the Italian uh, revolution had failed, the Vienna Rosso, and the Italian Soviet had not been uh, put, put in place, and he started thinking, well, why is that? Why Marx and Engels promised these constant revolutions because of the internal contradictions in capitalism? And yet, the, the worker is not rising up constantly to overthrow the system. And he came up with his idea of the hegemonic narrative. And he really is extremely important. I don't think you can, you can uh, underplay uh, the importance that he's had right here in this country in your lives. And, and that is, the, the, the worker had, had uh, internalized the trappings of his, uh, of his oppressor. He, he didn't really disagree with the manifesto and with Lenin so much that he expanded on it. He said, well, the worker. Doesn't it, he? He doesn't. He disagrees that religion is the opiate of the masses. The, the the worker actually is faithful to God. The worker doesn't agree with the manifesto that that the family must be abolished. The worker likes his wife and his children. The worker doesn't believe in internationalism. He's patriotic, and the worker doesn't really have that much of a beef with uh, with capitalism. Uh, so, you know, uh, he's got false consciousness, and we need to work assiduously to. To, to change his false, false consciousness and, and to deprogram the worker and, and elevate him, raise his consciousness and, and indoctrinate him. And this has now given rise to a mutant form of communism, which is of Marxism, which is what we're facing in this country. It's very, very successful. And, and, and the, the steps are, um, the first one is organize, organize, organize. Uh, the second one is indoctrinate, 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 and convince uh, the key, key points as a key members of society to overthrow the narrative. And what I mean by it, and, and this is what we're seeing here, this is what we're now seeing in the United States uh, when uh, children in high school, for example, are shown a video about Thanksgiving before Thanksgiving uh, in which it says, well, the pilgrims introduced diseases, the, the pilgrims uh, robbed uh, graves, and the pilgrims uh, killed and pillaged, and they should never have come here. And all of us are now presently standing on stolen land this is a Gramscian attempt at overthrowing the American hegemonic narrative. You must understand that in that context, uh, this is the, 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 the cultural narrative, and they want to introduce. So when Alicia Garza, for example, the, the, the leader of Black Lives Matter, when she tells audiences, My, we need to work really hard to dismantle the organizing principle of society, you know, this is not an argument over the, the marginal 
to tax rate. This is dismantle the organizing principle of society. And that is a Gramscian attempt at overthrowing the hegemonic narrative. Uh, and was surprise, surprised. Alicia Garza gets introduced into Marxist ideas by the school of soul, the school of, of unity and liberation, soul. Who founds soul? Harmony Goldberg. Who is Harmony Goldberg? She's a cultural, cultural anthropologist who is an expert on Gramsci. She writes extensively on Gramsci. And it's at, the, at Seoul that Alicia Garza picks up all these ideas. And they're happening right now. And, 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 and they have a blueprint, which is seize on a crisis, um, you know, promote its stability. But before that, indoctrinate people. And then we're seeing this explosion uh, critical race theory, which is this, by the way, at the same time that Gramsci was thinking this, a bunch of German Marxists were thinking the same things. Like, why is, why, why did the German revolution fail in 1919? They get together for a work week, a Marxist work week in Germany in the countryside and say, um, well, it, it, and it's very similar. Their explanation is a, a, a conceptual superstructure. And we need to, to, to with, through critical theory, criticize this to bits. And, and, and destroy it and dismantle it and, and liberate the worker. The worker is happy because he's an idiot. He doesn't understand how happy he should be. He's oppressed. He doesn't understand the, the nature of his oppression. This is all, they, by the way, they were Marxists. They, they wanted to call their institute, we know that as a Frankfurt School, but they wanted to call it the Institute for Marxism. And, and it's only because they, they thought it was too provocative that they changed the name. And all those little Inside jokes is about how Marxist they are. I see you nodding over there. You, you know, you know all this. I was talking to uh, Morgan earlier, and I, I, I sent her something, an essay that I thought was very novel. And she goes like, "Yeah, no, I say this all the time. You know, I th people think I thought it was crazy until I read you say it. So it's like, well, <laughs> so, freak some people out sometimes, and then I'm like, oh, I'm outside of my circle. <laughs> so, so um, you know, they, they, they really. So they have the, the, the foundational text of critical race theory. It's a red book. Uh, which was published in, in, in 1993. What do they call it? They call it the Big Red Book. Ha, 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 big joke. See, Mao had a little red book. They have a big red book. Um, and all of the jokes is about how Marxist they are. So this is all I want to say. I'm very, in, in. I don't know what solutions are. I drive Angela crazy because, you know, I, I don't, people ask me, what's your blueprint? I, frankly, I say, I don't have a grand strategy. I don't, my job is to, to shed light on these things. And, and, and I was talking to Katie, and Katie said, she does, she needs me. I do know, people have told me, people smarter than me, which is practically the entire world, that we, we have to be informed, that grand strategy needs to be informed by what happened in the Cold War. But this is a different thing. We're not fighting, we're not facing the Soviets in the fold the gap. We're not facing the, the Soviets in the field of Central America. We're facing them inside our borders. They're Americans. They're fellow Americans who are using, by and large, constitu constitutionally protected practices. The reason I talk like a madman about these things is because I think that we need to have come up with a grand strategy. We need the, the, the Cold War, the Soviet Union concentrated minds. Um, I'm not young, as you can tell, uh, and I we invited two young people here because this is really about convincing young people. You know, so it's, somebody, by the way, talked about Gramsci as persuasion. No, I don't think it's persuasion, it's, in, uh, it's, it's indoctrination, but I can see the point. And um, we're very happy to have Zilvina Salinas. Did I say it right? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> Z, as you like to call it. The president of uh, a very good outfit, by the way, the Foundation uh, for Economic Education. Lee recognized it, by the way. I want to recognize somebody who just joined us, Dr. Spaulding. They, a member, the best member of a very illustrious family, I would say. <laughs> um, and, and then Morgan Ze uh, Zegers or Zegers? Zegers. Zegers, whom I, I really want to thank because we had somebody who was slated to be on this panel. She became uh, sick this morning. She had to go to the doctor. And, and I, you know, Katie said, Morgan Zegers is amazing. And I was like, I, you know, really? I don't know. <laughs> I Googled her, and then I talked to her, and I, I yeah, so really, thank you very much yeah, thank you. For, for, for coming here in, in such short notice. I, I said you do amazing work. Z, why don't you take it from here, and just, you can speak however long you want. Uh, this is different from the, from the previous panel, and you don't have to follow what I have discussed. You can follow, you discuss how, how you convince people your age of, of the threat of communism. 
Well, probably this is the, one of the few panels in which I'm referred to as a young person. <laughs> <laughs> Just turned 40. <laughs> uh, but thank you for that. Uh, anyway, so as you can tell by my weird name and typical Georgian accent, I'm not really from around here. Well, now I live in Atlanta, Georgia, but I was born and raised in Lithuania on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, not by choice, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came to U.S. in 2019. So I lived th through socialism, I lived and it, I lived and it ended, I lived all these stories that the first panel was talking about. For me, those are personal. Those observations, the lines, the sunbathing while Chernobyl is exploding because no one told us, those are not observed or read or theorized. For those, for those things are practical. So I'm a very practical person. Um, uh, I hate socialism, but as much as I hate it, I know I can, I can write a good, I don't know, I can write a book, I guess, I can make a video series about how much I hate socialism, but that will not change anything. So I'm a man of action and I want to do something about it. Uh, and have a, I have a fees grant strategy, and of course he has done many things throughout our 75 years, and one of our quips is we outlasted the Soviet Union. We lasted for 75 years, that is longer than the Soviet Union, so take that. But of course we want to do more than just last. Lasting without achieving anything, that's just a waste of resources. Uh, so what we do right now, because we have excellent organizations like Heritage to take care of policy, we have other organizations to take care of politics and local politics, we at FIRA are going after young people. And our midterm strategy, I wouldn't call it grand strategy, our midterm strategy is uh, regular conversations with 4 million 16 to 22 year olds per week. Uh, why 4 million? That's 10% of the 16 to 22 population. If we want to change the way the generation thinks, we need to talk to the entire generation. Not select few, not the people who we already agree with, not the people, not the young people who wear blazers and khakis. Those are already on our side. There is no point. I hate nothing more than preaching to the choir, but I like talking to you. <laughs> uh, so our grand strategy is talking to young people. And this is what we specialize in. This is what we research. That is the goal of fee right now. Uh, let me share one to three, six observations uh, from, from our work in the, in the field or in the line, so to speak. Uh, first, yes, it is, a, it is a battle of definitions, which is also part of the good news. There are multiple research done, and yes, I think the most quoted one is a Pew Research, in, w in which more or less the same portion of young people agree, have positive view of socialism and, and capitalism. Uh, that is true. But then there are more in-depth studies, which they go and talk to young people and say, well, how do you define socialism? The good news is most of them define socialism as Denmark, which of course is stupid, but that's a good news. <laughs> then asked, you know, do you view, do you favorably view a system in which the means of means of production belong to the government? Uh, people don't really know what what that is. They th there are some who do. Uh, there are the, the young Bernies in there, but most of them they think it, they think Denmark. So that's that's my first sort of observation. So yes, many people talk about socialism and talk about it positively. I think we also sometimes make a mistake. Whenever someone brings something up, we call it socialist. So whenever someone says, hey, you know, universal basic income, let's give money to everyone. People say, oh, that's socialist. Well, first of all, that's not true. There's nothing free under socialism. I mean, there was no universal basic income in the Soviet Union. If you didn't work, you would go to jail because you'd be de declared a parasite or a vagrant. So whenever we try to pass, whenever someone promises free money and we say that's socialism, we in fact are making a historical mistake since that's not how things happen. And we're making a, well, a tactical mistake because we, we make socialism look better than it is. If some, what we should really call socialism is well, the 966 uh, work week, you know, nine hours, uh, nine hours per week uh, is, uh, from nine, sorry, 996, the Chinese thing, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six, six hours, six days per week, that's socialism. I mean, sun, Saturday was a work day for many days. I still remember going to school on Saturdays because it used to be work day. So, but I point it this way. All the relaxing things, all the things that people like, free money to everyone, that's not socialism. Let's not call it socialism because that's two mistakes in one and we're actually helping our enemies. Point number two. Um, uh, I think that, so I'm in, I'm in policy, I'm in arguing for liberty since 2006. I used to work for Lithuania Free Market Institute for, for many years, and uh, I, even in my short career, can, I can observe a difference that sort of before 2009, we could win any argument by, telling, by identifying something as socialism. You know, a, a government wants to run a free program of something or some, some silly thing. The government wants to produce chairs for some reason. We say, well, that's socialism, and we would win the argument. However, I think since after, after 2009, after 2011, the script has flipped. I think, and we still sometimes think we adhere to old modes of, 
of argument. We think we're going to call something socialist and that's going to disqualify it. Well, not anymore, which means we get to, we need to, we used to use this as a, as a kind of as a lazy shortcut. I know I used to, I used to use it. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, socialism has lost its, neg the, the, the word has lost its negative connotation. And when we call something socialist, whether it's right or wrong, it's not helping anymore. So when someone proposes free healthcare or government run healthcare, healthcare, rather than saying that socialist and you know dropping the mic thinking we've just convinced everyone, we, sh we actually should be more intellectually busy and more intellectually honest and describe why that is bad. Because people, they, they hear a thing free, they understand that they're gonna get something for free and we, sell, we tell them that socialism, once again, we're not convincing anyone and in fact, we're making socialism look better than it is. So that's sort of my, uh, my, other, my other point. My fourth point is we, uh, I, I hear this from, from time to time of people saying, well, these lazy millennials with young millennials, all these kids, teenagers with their pants and skateboards, you know, whenever they start paying taxes, they'll understand, you know, how government is. They'll stop being so socialist. Uh, well, no, that's not how it works. In fact, if you look at the data, the 25 to 39 year olds, so my folks, those are more socialist than 14 to 18 year olds. So it's not so much that young people are inexperienced and that drives them to socialism, even though, of course, some of them are. In fact, I would say, once again, think about it this way. High schoolers are much more entrepreneurial or have a much higher view of entrepreneurship than people my age. So I think it's a little more complicated than kids will stop being socialists than they grow up. No, no. Kids, kids are very pro-capitalist when they're young. They want to be an astronaut. They want to be a businessman and an astronaut at the same time. They're full of hopes and dreams. And then life happens. And at 35, you go for a little depression. And life is not what you thought you, it would be. You're not an astronaut or a millionaire. And then you start blaming capitalism. <laughs> My point is the battle is larger than just young people. And the facts, factors that drive people towards socialism are more profound than just lack of experience. In fact, I would say the young people that we work with, they, many of them are very amazing. Uh, something like, uh, the, I think uh, last year's research, research from the Walton Family Foundation, 87% of 14 to 18 year olds believe in American dream. 87% of young Americans believe in American dream in a sense that if you work hard, you will succeed. This is very good. I mean, it can get worse, but my point is don't just Let's not just wait for kids to grow out of it. It's more complicated than that. And I have two more, two, two more points left. One, of, and, and that's now coming more into action. How, we, how do we win our convincing game? How do, how do we win this? Well, but one very first, very simple thing is, you know, our customer preferences have changed. Once again, customers ask our customers, the, the, the audience, they have changed. They want different things. Uh, and once it, just, just labeling some social doesn't work anymore. Uh, a quick example, we ran this uh, three-year three year long, $2 million uh, price tag research on, and, on testing young audiences. An example I always give, uh, so we, 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 we had a market firm and one of the things that the market research firm did, they set a bunch of young people and they, and they tested a bunch of uh, uh, conservative and libertarian slogans with them. So the one that scored the highest, 56% of young people agree with it, is don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. That's a classical libertarian argument. Now, if you want to, once again, if you want to say young people are communists, no, they're not. You could say they're ra rapid uh, individualists. I mean, that's as libertarian as it gets, 56%. Taxation is theft. That slogan scored 9%. Now, of course, taxation is theft. My point is both of them are good arguments. Both of them are good slogans. Let's pick one over the other. So when talking to young people, let's talk about what they care about, in which cases, you know, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, rather than jam a white paper about the evils of a corporate income tax. They don't know what tax is, they don't know what corporate income is, and they've never paid tax. My point is there are ways to unlock, there are ways to unlock the young minds, there are ways to get them interested, but once again, but once again part of that is just as simple as customer or consumer research. Let's not, and let's not think that just because we think young people are going to love it, they're going to love it. And I think Morgan is going to talk about that a lot. We all make that mistake. We all think we're young. Some of us are. Some of us are not. And it's not just an age thing. It's also, you know, demographic, your experiences, customer research, understanding your audience is key, and that's what we're going for. My final point, and it's a little bit of a challenge, is, and it has to do with the, our audience, if you poll young people, what do they care about? A bunch of things. The top thing on their mind is environment and climate change. 
Now, I scoff at that and say, psha, you know, well, if you read something in 1970s, blah, blah, blah. They don't care about that. <laughs> 1970s is ancient history, and as, and as awful and touching the stories of Soviet Union are, I mean, they are very touching to me. To a bunch of people born after 2000, that's the same as Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> sure, I learned that in history. Bad things happen. What does it have to do with me? You have third-generation Cubans who when hear stories about Huber say, well, yeah, but that was my grandpa. What, what does he have to do with me? So my point is, once again, let's look at what our customers care about. And the top thing young people care is environment and climate change. And leave that to this. What is our answer to this? To say that is not a problem? To say that, uh, well, actually, I don't know what our answer is. And that, my point, that, that's just one block in which we need to get better at. I'm not saying, now, I'm not saying let's adopt the leftist policy on that because then we just lost. But we need our policies and our solid answers to the thing that young audiences care about. If we don't do that, we'll leave them uh, to the leftist. And that's what I would absolutely hate to see happen. Thank you, Z. <coughs> and now, uh, Morgan. Morgan, if I didn't mention it before, you're the CEO of Young Americans Against Socialism, so you're ideal to speak. Uh, this is a free format. Uh, talk to us as long as you want, then we go to uh, Katie and then we'll engage in a conversation. All right, well, thank you guys so much. I've got to say, uh, I'm so honored to even just fill in. I mean, especially for Inez, I think she's wonderful. And uh, I'm kind of an outsider to all this stuff. So to get to go to Heritage Foundation is so nice. And I really am just honored to be here. Uh, to give an example, actually, of how much of an outsider I am, one time I was on a planning committee with Inez. And she was asking who I think would fit this spot really well to talk about something with culture and socialism. And I said, have you heard of this guy, Jared Stepman? He's like really good. He went to the socialist convention. It was her husband. Uh, yeah, and so I gave like a full 30 second pitch on him. I, I was so excited to give her like my little tip. Um, so that's, you know, where I'm from. I actually am from Washington, D.C., back during college era. And so I'm back, and I don't really like it. It's very gray and bureaucratic here. Um, I'm from upstate New York, and my dad's a colonel in the military. He served in Iraq. He served on 9-11 because we're in upstate New York, about three hours north of the city. And so when I went to college, I did it because I was in the VFW, and I did a bunch of veterans advocacy. I was in the ladies' auxiliary in high school, and I wanted to work in veterans advocacy after college. So I found out American University would be a really good fit. And I'm thinking, American University, can you think of a cooler name? Uh, I mean, come on, it must be great. So I go to American, uh, it turns out it's 90% liberal. It's the number one most politically active campus in the country. Really? So I come from a county with more cows than people, and I go to American. And you guys had your own experience, the Gorkas did, at American's campus. It was just quite radical. I have a ton of little stories I could tell you. Like uh, one time they wanted a segregated cafe, and so they protested for days. It was a whole thing. But the one thing that really stuck with me was when during my last year, I moved into a house off campus with some girls. And I knew some of them, but I didn't know some of the others. And so I went from room to room to introduce myself to the new girls. And when I got to the basement, the girl in the basement had a poster on her wall. And so I'm trying to talk to her, and I'm trying to you know, make eye contact and respect her with it. But then I keep getting distracted, and I'm looking over again, but I'm trying to look back at her. And I realized my eye is being drawn to this poster of Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx, and Fidel Castro. <laughs> now, those are some pretty bad guys. And so with what I knew at the time, just graduated high school and into college for a couple years, I know they're bad. And the poster has them with little party hats on their head and fruity cocktail umbrella drinks. And it says, welcome to the party. <sighs> now, these are some mass murderers and dictators. And I don't exactly know what to say. But from what I knew from going to public school, I graduated in 2015. I actually turned 25 on December 26. And so I graduated in college in 2018. I was kind of right in the thick of it. And I can really testify to what I learned about the 20th century in public school. So I look at her, and you would think, you know, my dad's a colonel. I'm going to work in veterans advocacy. I go to American University in our nation's capital. I would know what to say when I met a communist. And I didn't because, what do you know, she gave me the usual talking points. She said, oh, yeah, her ideas, if tried again, because they just didn't work the last time, and she's talking so positively, we would uplift the working class, we would end poverty, and we would provide dignity to the working people of America. What do you say to that? I don't know. Do I want to tell her, well, I don't want to do those things. 
Uh, and so it just, imagine that, two girls in a basement, one has mass murders and dictators on her wall, and then the other is like, well, I also don't like poverty, and I like human dignity. Um, mm. So for me, I left that conversation so disappointed in myself because I thought I would know what to say in a situation like that, and I didn't. And so I graduated and I move on, and I end up working in marketing at this company called Media Hub in Boston. And my clients were for Grass Seed, Scott's Miracle Grow, and uh, VH1. So MTV, they're like reality shows. And I'm kind of a grandma, like I don't do the TikTok thing or any of that stuff. So I'm getting briefed on Cartel Crew. The same time as this is happening, AOC is now in office. Democratic socialism is being normalized. My peers are talking about the primary and, and what they liked about Bernie Sanders and why they voted for him because they had tens of thousands of dollars of student loan debt. They're living in Boston. They have the same amount in student loan debt payments as they are paying for their $1,000 apartment in Boston. And they're being paid like maybe $35,000 a year. That's uh, So for them, no political conversation happened in that office other than, oh my gosh, yeah, I see no way out of this. I'm totally voting for Bernie. It was nothing beyond that, okay? And every girl at the table was like, oh yeah, same. And my heart is like, oh, okay, this is not good. So as I'm getting briefed on Cartel Crew and the new season that's coming out, and I'm seeing the downfall as my country or my generation embraces these ideas, they're telling me, we've got to get a lot of people, millions of people to watch Cartel Crew. Okay, we've got to remind the people there's blood, there's drugs, there's sex, there's violence at the border. We've got to get them to watch the show. And I'm just sitting there so depressed because I was working until seven o'clock at night and then walking back to my little apartment. So that's when I decided, okay, so I make coordinated media campaigns and you have an audience that you wanna target and you, you try and reach them with micro-targeting and advertising and all these things. What if we did that but for subjects that actually had positive meaning other than just getting millions of people to watch a reality TV show? And that's kinda how I got into starting my nonprofit, Young Americans Against Socialism, where we started interviewing. I know Daniel was here, maybe he left, but he's from Venezuela. I reached out to him and I said, can you meet me at, uh, at the Hill? We met at the lawn of the hill and I just brought a little camera guy that I hired per hour and we interviewed his story of leaving Venezuela and coming to America. Our second interview that we posted online was with a man who escaped Cuba. He windsurfed uh, 90 miles over 10 hours from Cuba to the Florida Keys, got picked up by the Coast Guard just uh, 15 miles off the coast, got brought back to Cuba, was beaten for years because, uh-oh, he got caught. And then he spent a few years applying for refugee status, moved to America, joined the military, served in Afghanistan, and then tells the video straight to camera, I'm worried my daughter is not going to grow up understanding the horrors of socialism because it's so detached from the youth in America, and now she's being raised here. And so it's just like, ugh, lesson after lesson. Side note, his interpreter is stuck in Afghanistan right now, and we've been working with him to get him out. So it's just, you know, great American government status right there. But that video got 25 million views on social media. And from then on, I was like, ooh, we're on to something. Because as, as Dr. Gorka said, it's about the emotion. It's about telling the stories. And that was two years ago. Um, and so we've just been continuing to interview people. But when we move into other things, I mean, these interviews freak people out. The, the, interviewer, the interviewees start crying, and then I start crying, and it's emotional. I mean, recently we interviewed someone who was forced to squat she arrived at the Chinese communist slave labor camp and was forced to squat for 15 hours. And then if you're not tortured that day to change your mindset and get re-educated, you are then sent to work in a factory where you're probably gonna go make American products. So that's the kind of story, what do you know, we're censored by Facebook all the time, we're demonetized because we share these kinds of things. So these interviews freak people out and what we're now transitioning into beyond just the interviews is solutions oriented. People understand for the most part that something's going on in the country. They understand something is not working and things are going in a pretty bad direction and they are demanding, begging for solutions. And that's where we've just seen this massive explosion in social engagement online beyond the interviews. As soon as we provide a how, a solution, an action item, whether it's national or local or individual level, we're seeing massive engagement on that and sharing specifically via DM. So that means that a person is sending this privately to a, a member of their family or a friend or someone in their life because they want them to see that content. And that is so impactful to me. I'm talking tens of thousands. So that's really where I see the future of this. 
And our, our solutions-oriented initiative now is going to be called the Freedom Guide, and it is everything about how to rethink education, rethink community, and rethink leadership in your own life and in uh, the lives of those around you, your, your kids, what you're passing down to them. So, yeah, that's kind of what we're working on. That was, uh, that was really awesome. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thank you. And, and lastly, we have uh, a, really one of my best colleagues here, Katie Wilka. She, I love uh, having have an intellectual uh, you know, battle with her all the time. And, and she's very, not only is she really super intelligent, she's also very kind. So we discussed uh, maybe having some solutions since I'm bereft of it. And there are, we have heard some good solutions here, but go ahead, Katie. Well, I think we've actually got three incredible sets of solutions here at the podium. And I have to say, coming into this, I was optimistic anyway. Um, but it, this really makes me hopeful. So I think each one of you is doing something so extraordinary. Um, Mike, I, I just have to give you so much credit for uh, what you did with the two books that you've come out with in the last two years in terms of exposing the ideology of these new movements, um, you know, particularly last year, the starting with last year, your work on Black Lives Matter um, has just been so impactful. And Z, I love how um, just mission oriented and pragmatic you are in, in tackling this, truly. I mean, it, it makes me hopeful. Um, and Morgan, I, I can't even talk about it. your your energy is just so great, and the fact that you're you're doing this and that you're passionate about it, I think is is fantastic. Um, you know, look, the founders looked back at thousands of years of history and human development, and they kind of took the best of what they saw. They took the lessons of what they saw, and they had this idea. They said. Let's build a nation on notions of rule of law, private property, representative government. We think that that's the system under which the most people will prosper and which will be the most just. And what do you know? They were right. But the incredible thing is, and there's probably some, some mathematical formula here, but at, through, at every certain point, that idea is fundamentally challenged and challenged in a really profound and serious way and what has often seemed in an existential way. And I was really thinking hard about, you know, if you look at the pattern of every time this happens and and how do we prevail? How does the American idea prevail time and time again? Well, I think the, the first, the most important thing about it is every system that's been suggested to challenge the fundamental American idea proves to be oppressive to a significant group of people. And that, that injustice, the injustice of it, is eventually rejected and we come back to recognizing the power, the legitimacy of the American idea. So that's kind of fundamentally, I think, what allows me deep down to be optimistic. But I wanted to just say something specific about the strategy that we used or the strategy that, that was sort of, um, that really came about because it was kind of organic and spontaneous in a lot of ways under the Soviet Union, uh, under our fight against the Soviet Union, because I think it was really instructive. And it's really interesting to me because I think you see it happening in its own unique way today with who we have at the table. So the really, there were just a handful of really key moments in the fight against the Soviet Union. <clears throat> and the first, of course, I think would have to be George Kennan's The Long Telegram. He identified what was wrong with the Soviet Union and how the, their ideology made them fundamentally incompatible with the United States. And honestly, that's how I see Mike's work on BLM. So I don't know if you all know this, but last year when BLM emerged, um, Mike and, and Andy Olivastro wrote, quickly put out um, an editorial which was published in the, in the New York Post 
talking about the Marxist roots of BLM really before I think anybody else. It was the first big statement. And the Heritage Foundation jumped on it and very quickly turned around a video. And that video was so impactful. I don't even know what the number's up to now, but it, it got millions, millions, yeah. millions of people. Yeah, the article was about millions. It was right. very, very shocking, actually. And it was so important that, that, that the Marxist aspect of BLM, its anti-family, anti-human uh, elements were exposed. Now, do you educate every, does everybody just buy it right away? No, it takes a long time. I mean, how long, you think about how long it took after George Kennan exposed the Soviet Union, how long it took to grow that message year over year over year. But it happened and that was critical. Um, another, another, I think really key moment, um, two, two key moments in that fight were um, the Clifford Elsie report in 1950. Unfortunately, th this one is a lot less known, but I think it was it was very, very critical. Uh, two men basically took a survey of, of everybody of, of importance in the United in, in Washington in leadership to look at, okay, so what do we do now? And they were so um, insightful in terms of again expanding on what Kennan saw why the Soviet Union was incompatible with the United States. And that then formed the basis for the Truman Doctrine. I, I always love to talk about NSC 68. I think it was key. And I, I just have to tell you all, I was reading it again last night. Paul Nietzsche wrote NSC 68. It is one of the most beautiful, well-written, concise, insightful documents you can read about the United States, about who we are, and who the Soviet Union was. I just, it, it's beautiful. But I'm gonna skip that, just having said that. The other piece that I wanna talk about, the other, I think, key moment in sort of helping give us insight into the strategy, the tactics that we need to be adopting today. And that was something called the Active Measures Working Group. So. It, for those of you who are old enough to remember, after uh, the, the, the Church Commission report um, came out and talked about sort of the abuses of the CIA and the FBI, there were massive changes in how the United States was going to approach intelligence. And we essentially said, we're going to stop paying attention to many of the things that the Soviet Union is doing in putting out its lies about the United States. And essentially three young guys, I think they were Romerstein and, and Angelo Cotevilla and blanking on the third, Romerstein, Cotevilla, it'll come to me. Um, three guys who I think, two of them were in their 20s, one was in their 30s, they were staffers, they worked in Washington, they said, we cannot take our eyes off of what the Soviet Union is doing in its lies about the United States. And they, they, they started this process in a very quiet way of studying it and exposing it. And it grew and it grew and it grew until it reached President Reagan, until it reached, it became an official working group within the US government. And it was really instrumental in honestly, in, in developing Reagan's strategy to, to combat Soviet communism. The reason I mentioned this story in particular, which always really moved me, is because it shows what the impact can be when a handful of people decide that something is important, something needs to be fought, and that they can take action in their, what might seem like a small way initially, but it can really turn things around. I particularly wanted to tell this story for Mike, because Mike is pessimistic. I don't know if you noticed oh. that. Yeah, you are. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you are. Uh, okay. Anyway, when we first talked about this, I felt like he was feeling a little dark about the prospects for the future. And I just wanted him to know um, that I think particularly you know, you're inside of your work, and it's probably also because you're really tired because you are traveling all the time talking about your books. But these books that you've written and the articles that you're writing that are exposing 
what the other side is doing and why their ideology is fundamentally incompatible with the American idea, I think this is really, I, to me, this is the foundation of what's going to allow us to win. That's extremely kind of you. Thank you, Katie. I, I, I thank you. I, I won't. It, trust me, it won't go to my head. I have three teen, teenage children. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I'm going to ask quick questions of the three of you, and then uh, perhaps kick in the audience. We have about 20 minutes left, um, and it's my prerogative because Katie decided I was a moderator. So, Z, I'm going to start with you. You, if I understood you correctly, you said that we need to speak to the to the young people, and speak about the things they care about. Um, and I, 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 I guess I keep going back. One of, everybody has quoted Thatcher uh, already today, so I'm going to quote Thatcher too. When somebody said to her once, "We need to find out what public opinion is," she stopped and you know stared down and said, "No, I create public opinion. I don't go out and try to poll what public opinion is." And I wonder, since one of the themes here has been that people really do not understand the nature of communism, how, how evil, truly evil it was, shouldn't we not give up on that? Shouldn't we? T it's just not Napoleonic, right? There's, there's a, there are a lot of people, just like I know that my children, uh, in writing reports for, for, for their schools, talk to survivors of the Holocaust. And that was very important. Um, there are many people who are survivors of communism, many of them I hear Gabriella Hoffman, who's here, constantly talks about her parents' experience, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a very important thing. Shouldn't we be, be, be bearing this witness? Well, that's not either or. It's a, it's a false dilemma. It's either we talk what young people care about, or we talk about what happened 50 years ago. I mean, if, yeah, we need to do both. That's one thing. And even the stories that we tell about communism, we need to tell them in such a way that young people would understand, relate, and get the right message. I mean, everyone likes to talk, everyone likes to read, write, to read books and all that, but you know, if, if the measure of an idea uh, was of how many books are written about it, we'd all be capitalist. If people were so rational that we would go by the best argument, we'd be, we would have been capitalist for, for many years. I mean, I, at Fee alone, there is a whole wall of books, of great books about why capitalism works and why liberty is the only choice, but no one reads them. And that's, you know, and that's this, we need to recognize that reality. So one, uh, talk to people in a way that people understand and relate. Two, it's not either just talk about what happened 50 years ago or 30 years ago, but what actually appeals to young people today too. I think we can, we can do that. And three, and that will be my sort of challenge. Well, now, if, if four of us represented CNN, Fox, MSNBC, and the, I know, and someone from Hollywood, we could say, we could sit down and set the agenda, but, Right now, we probably need to recognize what for every book that we write, for every even for even for every video that we remake that we make, the other side makes a hundred of them. So it's not like we have the titans of industry of mass information saying, you know, I make the news. We don't. We sometimes do, and we feel very good about ourselves. But the other side is a thousand times better. So we need to find these asymmetric responses with guerrilla warfare tactics. In once again, in how to get public interest in our ideas. So my final point on this, given the, our current limitations, given the, given the asymmetry of power, if we talk about things that only we care about rather than the public, we're going to get nowhere very fast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was, that was great. Thank you. Uh, Morgan, you said something that I really picked up on right away. You said that, unless I misunderstood you, that the, the, the young people out there sense that something is going on in the country. What do you mean by that? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? How do they pick that up? How do they how do they relate that to you when you talk to them? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say this is not just young people that are aware of something bad going on. This is all generations. And I don't mean to put any blame on Gen X or anything, but I think for multiple generations before Gen Z and millennials, there was this dangerous complacency. It was this idea that, oh, well, we're always going to be like this. So we can just send our kids to public school and they'll come home from the school bus every day. And, and what do you know? They'll be raised to be good people. And that didn't exactly happen. It was a dangerous complacency that led to a problem we're facing now. Um, so that being said, I'm really excited because a lot of people are looking for information and they're looking for resources. I mentioned, oh, Daniel's here. Daniel's the one I was telling you about. Um, so I mentioned before we started with the testimonies, they were like five minutes and they got millions of views. That's one thing we can do, but I think there's just so many other things that have to be done. And so that's why I liked your answer just now. Um, part of what we're doing and what we need to be doing is connecting the dots. This is such a big, important part. Like I said, I'm 25 in a couple weeks, 
uh, December 26, kind of a big deal for, to have a birthday. But um, uh, I'm 25 soon. I graduated high school 2015. And so when I think of what did I learn about the 20th century, you do learn about Cuba. You do learn about Pol Pot. You do learn about Nazi Germany. And you learn a little bit about the USSR. But what they teach you beyond the Nazi Germany stuff, that covers a lot of the 20th century year, months of it. What's spent in like 1950s and after is teaching you that there were some dictatorships that led to genocides. The connecting of the dots does not take place. And so for before COVID in 2019, I had started this and so I had been around and doing interviews and stuff for like six months and then COVID hit. And people would always say, what's the indoctrination in the classroom like? Are the leftists taking over? And I would explain it as, Eh, it's, it's based on my experience and my friends, because I interview a lot of my friends on this, it wasn't like there was direct indoctrination, and this was 2019 before CRT and stuff. Um, it's not like there's direct indoctrination, it's just more so they're leaving so much out, and they're not connecting the dots in a proper way, so it's, it's misinformation in an indirect way that makes it so that young people cannot connect the dots when we hear the same problems and promises of today. And so a red flag never pops up in our head when we hear someone call themselves a democratic socialist. I mean, Castro called himself a democratic humanitarian. So the, the words mean nothing to me because I love history and I know the stories. But for my generation, they were just told that bad people came to power and then a lot of people died because they committed genocide. And so you learn that and you're like, oh, that's horrible. Pol Pot sounds scary. But you didn't learn that he came and all these people came with these great promises to improve society via democratic socialism and the rest of the fluffy words. So I think that's one of the biggest problems. That being said, that was pre-COVID. That was pre-1619 project, pre-CRT. Now we've de we're dealing with both problems. We've got direct indoctrination with curriculum. So I think one of the things we need to focus on is in re reforming curriculum in the school system for public schools. And I'll tell you this. I make this joke all the time. People are like, why do you do this to yourself? I don't even have a boyfriend. But I get excited at the thought of having kids and then not sending them to public school. <laughs> I say it all the time. And people are like, oh, is Morgan sad that she's single? Like, does Morgan need a boyfriend? No, I, I'm just just trying to tell the crowd and all the young women out there and young men especially that we need to be more intentional about the way we live our lives. We don't have to like be giving birth to a child to say, well, now what am I going to do about educating it? I think if we all changed our mindsets on these basic things about raising families and passing down values and teaching history, not relying on schools to do so, we're going to be in a great place. But that being said, not everybody can be like me and have a homestead one day with a bunch of property and homeschool my kids. That's what I want to do. But I know that it's just not possible for other people. There are always going to be kids in public school. That's At least that's what I think. I mean, we got some radicals out there that want to end it too. Sometimes I consider it. But we have to think more in a community mindset and care about the young minds in our communities that also deserve proper education. So that's where curriculum reform comes in and school choice comes in because it matters for us to have a multifaceted approach to education reform. It's not, it's not a one size fits all thing. We aren't one size fits all policy kind of people. So that's what I really focus on. And then when it comes to content online, what really works and when we talk about like having a viral video, I don't always just want to have these random viral videos that are five minutes. I want to build a community of not necessarily millions, but more practicably, a couple thousand or and then 10,000 across the country that are going to become community leaders that are going to raise big families and spread this mission. And that comes with little things like social content. So you mentioned uh, culture and reforming culture. Uh, an example for the Freedom Guide. Last week, we did an episode on the Cultural Revolution and connecting it to Black Lives Matter, connecting it to action items to protect American culture. And so we would start by a little history lesson. This is like a 20-minute video for a podcast. We explain four olds of the Cultural Revolution. Why would they want to get rid of these things? What is the Little Red Book? We then add a video of the founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Couleurs, she's caught on video a handful of years ago explaining that she was so proud when some young man came up to her before a speech and said, your book is like Mao's little red book. Yeah. And she says, oh, that's exactly what I was going for. Yeah. That like stops my heart hearing that. We all know, we're all like, what? Excuse me, because every TikTok influencer that does the dances has a Black Lives Matter fist in their profile and millions of followers. So we all see these connections. And for me, I love putting that drastic connection from 
teaching about history, showing the words of the people in America bringing it to our shores today and what they're doing to our kids, and then providing immediate action items. So that's kind of what we're at now, a little long form. And honestly, it's not going to be for everybody. But if we build a strong enough community of thousands and then tens of thousands across the country, that's really what I'm working on right now. Thank you. That was excellent. And by the way, in 2019, it would, it would have already been CRT. It began to really make inroads in K through 12 throughout the, the, two, the, the 2010s. And in fact, they talked about it. It was in other areas where they were kept limited in public policy. But in K through 12, they were already well in. And, and this is very easily documented. Katie, lastly, um, one of the things you, you said to me in a, a telephone conversation, you said that, uh, that I think it was Nate season in, in NSC 68, maybe it was not that, that said, we have to be true to ourselves. We have to be remain Americans, find out who, who we can't, you know, we can't trade on that. We have to re retain our Americanness and our principles. Um, and, and, and we have to persuade. Is there anything you want to add to that along those lines? Because I thought that, that actually was, I think that, that kind of touched base with me. Well, I think it was an incredibly important point, and the, the context in which he made it was um, identifying the enemy, what is it about their ideology that's incompatible with who we are, but then it's equally, it's equally important when you're developing a strategy to, to talk about who you are, and therefore, what means are we allowed to use, right? And his argument was, we can't use anything besides persuasion. Now, to be fair, we have used other things besides persuasion. Um, and it's really interesting, because I was really thinking about this, how interesting it is that with, with all these different um, battles that we have fought, you know, whether you're talking about the Civil War or coming forward to the fight against Soviet communism, um, the war of ideas was incredibly important, but it did also always end up um, you know, you had to bring in force as well, so something interesting there. But anyway, his idea was, we c it's not going to work to impose our will on others. We have to win by persuasion. And that's why the work that we're all doing is so unbelievably important, because we have to make the valid case for why the American idea is so much better uh, than than what else, what others are proposing, and that was Nietzsche in '68, right? In yeah. 68. Yeah. Thank you. And now uh, we have about ten minutes. If if somebody has a quick question, want to address it to one of us, please feel, feel free, Professor Kors. Uh, uh, to persuade people, uh, one has to reach people. Uh, the left reaches people in a system called K through 12 education, uh, high school and college. Uh, I've taught an honors seminar for decades at the University of Pennsylvania. Those are bright kids coming from great schools. Um, first time any of them with a handful of exceptions and we're talking decades had ever heard of Milton Friedman, Peter Bauer, Bastia, Thomas Sowell, John Stuart Mill, <laughs> Herbert Spencer. Right? They don't know them. Other people are reaching them and persuading them. We have abandoned our educational schools to the left. Not only in content, they can even apply their category of disposition to whether someone can teach all of America's children. We've lost that. Students at our best universities don't learn their economics in departments of economics. They learn them in English courses. They learn their economics in history courses. And the economics they learned are anti-economic. Unless one finds a way to break through the monopoly of persuading the young that is now dominated by the left, no number of videos, no number of conferences, no number of metrics showing students is going to change the intellectual catastrophe we now face. Education is theirs, and we let it happen. Professor Kors, is that it? 
fantastic question. Thank you very much for asking it. I changed, of course. None of you can ask any more questions because it's going to take up the, the remain. <laughs> so he ruined it for everybody. <laughs> By the way, I, I want to be the last, the, the, the latest one to say what, a, what an honor it is to have you here with us and what a great uh, talk you I'm going to leave to my three panelists to answer. Professor Course, how do we do that? Uh, I, I'll start. So another nerdy thing that I do, I, it's funny, usually I'm the nerd in the room and I feel like one of the dumbest people in this room. It's really an honor, you guys. Uh, I do a podcast on the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers and the ratification debate. And Charles Kessler wrote my favorite version where he wrote an introduction and he said, when the Federalists wrote the Federalist Papers, they were saying the Constitution is a document worthy of rational and enduring consent from an enlightened public. And it's so sad to think about, but I just don't think we're an enlightened public anymore. And I think we are mentally, spiritually, physically, and morally weak people. And it's all led and a part of this idea of being complacent with how things have gotten. And we can all, like you said, sit here and we can all talk about what we want to do, maybe the initiatives we want to start, maybe state level lobbying or a new bill for education reform. But nothing will matter unless people understand why it's important and people say, I want to participate too. And so we have to care. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is that freedom is a lifestyle. And for so long, everybody's like, well, I don't do politics. I like to be left alone. Everybody's probably heard that phrase. Um, I was at an event with Mike Pompeo, and he was like, well, politics does you. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness. Well, I, that's one way to put it. But it's, it's true. It's true. And we've said it too long. I will no longer accept that phrase anymore. Politics needs to be done by us in a way that allows us to preserve our values and allows us to be left alone in freedom and liberty and independence. And so I hope we can inspire people at an individual level and that's really where we, we have this positive remark, but it's never going to change unless people understand the importance of education reform and how accessible it really is for us to either homeschool or seek other opportunities for school choice or reform curriculum at a state level. I was talking to Katie about how there's one uh, bill that's been passed in about 11 states right now, and it requires education on the horrors of the Holocaust in order to ensure that those horrors never happen again. So I'm like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's small, but it's something we could do if we did the same same thing for the horrors of communism. And we got it passed in all the Republican trifectas, and then we move forward. It's something. It at least gives three to four days of those required horrors. It's something, right? So how can we start game planning? Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that excites me. And uh, I would like to continue to game plan with you guys and come up with opportunities where we can inspire people to have small and then larger and larger successes with reform in this area. That's great. Thank you, Z. Yes, on education, I agree. Uh, but uh, I have a little criticism for you. You know you know the phrase, then you, have a, then you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I kind of feel like for you guys, everything looks like a reform. But a simple, simpler way is to change what teachers teach than to go and say, now you shall teach this. Well, not a bad way. I'm not criticizing. And I'm telling you what we do. I'll tell you what we did. So in Lithuania, a couple of years ago, five years ago, we took, we took once again, similar, similar issues happening, a bunch of nonsense and all that. We said, well, which, which, in which lesson do, they, do people in K-12 come to realize these things? And that's economics. Okay, how many, who teaches economics? Teachers who don't really know economics. Same in Lithuania, same in the United States, a universal problem. Well, for us it was an opportunity. So we developed a curriculum, we developed a book, and in two years, 80% of all Lithuanian kids are now learning from a book that I wrote including teacher training, including everything. It happened in two years on a shoestring budget of $80,000. What we're doing at FEE right now is kind of similar. So yes, there are battles in, about school boards that need to be had. This is, this is all good. Compulsory teaching about uh, socialism, also good. We, went, we are going the other route. Rather than creating our own sort of thing, we are, well, working with the current system, which means we provide uh, materials for teachers. We go to schools and actually talk to kids. We go to schools and actually have economics <laughs> lessons. We have teacher training, have material, materials that teachers can use in the economics lesson that actually connect to what they're supposed to teach anyway. So m the point is, if we make our materials available, interesting, good, and once again, designed for teachers, not for us, and l let me go on a little bit of a rant, little bit of a rant. The pr many problems, many sort of think tanks on our side, when we start, when we start doing kids stuff, we think, well, we're just going to take a research paper we had, we're going to add some pictures to it, and kids are going to love it. No, 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 no. We, have to, we need to rethink it. We need to create a product that appeals to the actual kids, that appeals to the actual teachers, 
And the one th thing number one that teachers care about is, can I easily use that stuff in my classroom? They don't look at this and say, well, uh, the balance, uh, this is not Keynesian enough, this is not Mississippian enough. They don't even know who Keynes is. They don't care about these things. They care about very simple things. How do I teach my lesson and prevent students from running right in my classroom? If we can provide, if we can provide this, and yes, we can, we're going to have our materials and good economics and good values in schools. Let me finish. Let me leave you off with a jolly note. Uh, two years, two days ago, we signed a memorandum. We signed an agreement with one of the state departments of education. I'm not going to mention which one, not to jinx it. But fee will pro fee will train all economics teachers in that state. Wow. Fantastic! This is fantastic. A great way to end it. Uh, all good things must come to an end. I want to thank my co-panelists. One theme that we heard a, a lot today in this panel is the, the, the importance of telling real stories, people who have suffered under communism. And, you know, I was uh, in, in Jackson, Mississippi um, about two months ago, and a guy sat, I had dinner with a guy just nicely gent, gent before I, I spoke, and he said, well, why don't you talk about the first 12 years you spent in your life in Cuba? I said, well, I don't want to talk about that. I like talking about ideas. This is really what I'm excited about. He goes, no, no, talk about Cuba. And I said, yeah. So two weeks later, I found myself in Guatemala. I was having dinner with a friend, and she said to me, you know, I'm going to leave you something at the front desk. I fully expected to be a bottle of, of, of rum. <laughs> and it was the, 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 the Gospel of St. John. And uh, not quite what I had expected, but I, I decided to read it. And it actually, there was a line. He's quoting John the Baptist. He said, we talk about the things we know, but we bear witness to the things we have seen. And I thought that was like, oh, okay, well, this is better than probably rum, uh, because this is exactly what you, it's important to hear these stories of the people who have suffered through communism, not just talk about ideas, even though I will continue to talk about ideas. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Robert. You, you, you know how to project this. All right. Welcome to our panel, Communism Today. I am Elizabeth Spaulding, and it is my privilege to serve as the vice chairman 
of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. We are here to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the collapse of communism. But tragically, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, did not end communism everywhere. And in this panel, we explore the experiences of three eyewitnesses and three nations. And as you listen to their stories, I ask that you think about the more than 1.5 billion people who still live under communism today. Uh, first, introductions of our panelists. Rosa Maria Paya is a Cuban democracy activist and human rights defender. In 2015, she founded the citizen initiative Cuba Decide, a movement dedicated to changing the political and economic systems in Cuba toward democracy. She is also the daughter of the late Oswaldo Paya, recipient of VOC's highest honor, the Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom, recipient of the European Parliament's Sakharov Prize, and two-time nominee of the Nobel Peace Prize. And he was killed by the Cuban regime in 2012. Rosa Maria has a degree in physics from the University of Havana and is president as well of the Latin American Network of Young People for Democracy. Lily Tang Williams is co-chair of the New Hampshire Asian American Coalition and a member of the VOC Speakers Bureau. Lily was born to working class parents in China's Western Sichuan pro province just before the Cultural Revolution. She personally witnessed Mao's takeover and the horrors his regime inflicted on the people of China. Lily earned her BS in law from Pudan University and later her MS in social work at the University of Texas at Austin. She is now an avid promoter of civil and economic liberty, free markets, and free enterprise. And Daniel DiMartino was born in 1999 in Venezuela to a then middle-class family. His grandparents had escaped poverty and oppression in Italy and Spain and made a better future in what was then the fourth richest country in the world, Venezuela. Daniel experienced how socialism destroyed the once prosperous nation that welcomed his grandparents. He is dedicated to advocating for freedom in his homeland and stopping the same ideology from ever being implemented in the United States. He has a BA in economics from Indiana, Indiana University and is currently pursuing a PhD in economics at Columbia University. Daniel regularly appears on Fox News, CNN, and other news outlets, and on college campuses and at events like this one all around the country. And he is also a member of VOC's Speakers Bureau. So each panelist will share their account of life under these regimes, and then we will have time for your questions uh, and uh, more discussion. And each of our witnesses has a, a both a compelling and cautionary story to tell you about socialism and communists today. So first, we will start with a recorded message from um, Maria, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this invitation to the Herida Foundation. I do apologize for not being there in person with you. Ken asked me about my experience living in a communist totalitarian regime. And I think that the best way to put it is this one. Um, for you guys, every four years, no matter what party you belong to, there is a new dawn. But in my country, in Cuba, we have been living in what it seems like an eternal night for over 60 years. And yes, uh, communism, it mutilates the Cuban soul in order to control the society, but they cannot actually kill the dreams, the aspirations, the desire for freedom of the, of the Cuban people. And my father, Osvaldo Baya, he said that the night cannot be eternal. And that's why I, I do believe that we, uh, as a people, uh, we Cubans, we are in the threshold of freedom, in the threshold of uh, of true liberation. Actually, I'm sure that you heard about the massive protests that occurred during uh, July 11th in Cuba, where 
hundreds of thousands of Cubans took into the street across the whole country, province by province, demanding libertad, liberty. And there is a moment before and a moment after, July 11th, in that, because in that day, many Cubans felt freedom for the first time in their life, actually. One young protester at, uh, at the streets in front of the Capitol in Havana said in that, that, that in that moment, whatever you wanted to say, you felt free. And of course, the Cuban regime has done everything in its power to prevent that, that the Cuban people feel that freedom um, again. They imprison over a thousand protesters, the Diaz Canel, the puppet president appointed, appointed by the Castros, went out on national TV and give the Cuban police power to do whatever it needed in order to keep the dictatorship intact. And we know that they killed, they have killed, they did it during the during the during the protests. They did it against my father, Oswaldo Paya too. But the Cuban people, despite all the repression, tried again. In uh, in November 15, they petitioned in front of the world for the right to peacefully protest. And when the Cuban regime militarized the country and essentially established a, an island White House arrest, and the Cuban people weren't able to leave their, their, their homes, the Cubans in the diaspora, in over a hundred cities at, uh, around the world protest in, uh, in solidarity. And that's in part why um, here, <laughs> talking to you because you, the international community, the freedom-loving people of the world, you do, you do have a role in uh, in our uh, liberation, just as the governments, the democracies of the world, has a role, have a role in our uh, in our liberation. Um, I'm also here to talk to you about what we do. Uh, in Cuba de Cide, which is an initiative uh, whose name says it all, Cuba Decides Cuba de Cide. Our goal is, is singular, is to provide and walk a path for the Cuban people to decide their own future and transition into democracy uh, peacefully, of course, that requires a lot of internal pressure and also international pressure. That's why we work in the mobilization of the people in the in the island in, with with direct citizen outreach, but also in the mobilization of the international community to create the kind of pressure that ensures that the Cuban regime has no other option but to give in to the will of uh, the people. In a moment that I do believe is like the Berlin Wall of 1989 and 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 the Cuban Wall. I mean, our wall will uh, as Berlin's send uh, window winds of change uh, across the hemisphere because we wouldn't be talking about the collapse of democracy in Venezuela or the regression to the dictatorship in Nicaragua without the support of the Cuban regime, which is involved in uh, in terrorist activities. It, it is also involved in criminal activities dealing with, uh, for instance, uh, drug dealers across the across the hemisphere, which is actually an obstacle for the for the stability and the peace in uh, in all the Americas. So what what the international community could do, what the United States concretely could they do, uh, several very concrete things. Um, and that starts by denouncing together with the Cuban people the legitimacy of the Cuban regime, recognizing the Cuban opposition as valid interlocutors in this, uh, in this fight. For instance, in a few uh, days, uh, they are going to celebrate the summit of the democracies, the Cuban a opposition should be invited to that a, to that forum. The United States can also support technologically with a, um, providing internet access in a moment in which the Cuban regime control and censored the communications in in the island. I think that the, a, a world reaction is needed, a, a reaction similar to the one that the world took 
where with Sud South Africa to end the apartheid there. Well, we, the Cuban people, we are also suffering an, uh, an apartheid, a political one, an ideological one. And companies around the world, democracies around the world, they could embrace the Sullivan principles, pressure the dictatorship, cut the funds of the military, and support, support directly the demand for freedom of the Cuban people. Thank you so much. Thank you to Maria. Uh, Lily, please take it away. Well, thank you for having me. This is the first time I'm attending an in-person um, Heritage Foundation event. And uh, thanks to actually Dr. Edwards sitting here, 2017, I wrote to him to say, I'm so worried our kids in this country don't know what happened under communism. They know very little about Mao's Cultural Revolution. I want to do something to educate youth. Then he referred me to the VOC academic program, so now I have been with them for four years. But the things are getting more and more scary because, uh, like you all said, um, thanks to our educational government and school system, our youth really don't know much. When I went to classrooms, they would be just the eyes were huge to say, wow, that's very scary. We never heard such stories before. Even teachers were say, oh, Lily, we did not know that. Well, they went to teacher's college. How are they going to teach our kids when themselves even don't know the horrors of communism and socialism? I was born in Chengdu, Sichuan province, right before Mao started his uh, the great proletarian cultural revolution. And uh, my parents were illiterate workers. We should be the workers rule society. Everything's free, right? No. That's what our kids think today. It was not free except our horrible, primitive workers' row house provided by my dad's um, state factory. Everybody worked for state factory six days a week. And uh, our community housing, probably nobody in this country wants to live in there. It's a six, uh, eight families with children share one bathroom and share one water faucet. And if water is out, you cannot cook. It was very cold in the winter because the central planners in Beijing said, after you live, if you live in south of Yang, uh, Yellow River, no heating. So I had a frostbite on my left foot. Every year I got infected because of the cold weather. Um, but of course, we did not know anything true about the world. We were told that uh, Taiwanese people were suffering and American impureness is really bad, and uh, don't smile like uh, ugly Americans. Capitalism are uh, blood suckers. Profits are horrible. We should be grateful for Mao, for Communist Party. So we go to schools, and we chant every day, like you talk about little read the books, long never chant my Mao, long never Communist Party, da da da, 10,000 years, double 10,000 years. You, you do a little dance and moves, and then you start to study your Chinese and math. And uh, that's my life in government schools. I had no idea. I never challenged Mao is God or human. Why are we saying 10,000 years? Well, when the one party control controls all the press, all the media, all the peer articles, all the education, all the industries, all the properties, and everything, you have no way to know the truth. They even control the songs you're going to say. And, uh, what comedy you're allowed to tell. And the girls' boys were not allowed to talk about romantic love and to talk about, oh, I love my parents because Chen Mai Mao is more dear. Imagine the clothes I'm wearing, like you said, get rid of four olds by Mao's cultural revolution. Get rid of old culture, old ideas, habits, and the customs. So Chinese traditional dress like this, very colorful and the pretty, was a band. And your hair cannot lay down past your shoulder. And you cannot do the art, it's not politically correct. And you cannot even listen to music except this awful Chinese emperor, like, like Chinese Peking uh, opera designed by Chen Mai Mao's wife, Jiang Qing. <laughs> it's like, yee, 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 every day. <laughs> and you want to cover your ears, you cannot sleep in. Uh, yeah, it's like the whole country during the Mao's Cultural Revolution. 
It's like a concentration camp. 6.30 in the morning, because of my dad's community housing is next to my high school and, and middle school. So 6.30 in the morning, the speaker come up. Da, 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 time to wake up, time to go to school, time to go to work, long live Chiang Mai Ma, long live Communist Party. It's like what you say from Nazi movies, concentration camps. Of course, we did not know that. We did not know what the world's like outside at all. So I was a red child. Sounds familiar? Mao divided people into two big groups, like Marx did. Oppressor versus oppressed. And you have five red classes under oppressed, like my workers' parents. And then you have five black classes under oppressor. Who are the oppressors? Landlord, rich capitalist, white one nuts, and uh, country revolutionaries and bad influencers. And who define those arbitrary words to put them under black classes? The party. Mao. 20 million people died during Mao's Cultural Revolution. Lots of them are professors, teachers, intellectuals who just dissident represent different opinions about countries' policies and the propaganda every day. Every day, you cannot talk about other things. It's all about politics. It's all about PC. If I go to exercise, I have to write in my diary, I'm exercising today because Chiang Mai Ma wants me to be healthy and serve the country. Think about that. Politics is in your face every day. And you are not a human being. You are not allowed to ask questions. You are not allowed to think for yourselves. I wanted to look pretty, so I would wear red scarf, very colorful, you know, like a little maybe um, colorful clothes inside of my approved color, which is uh, white and blue and green. And I was criticized. You know, why do you want to wear that color? Oh, you, I want to look pretty, no. You're supposed to look like everybody else. You're supposed to look unisex clothes. You're supposed to get your hair up, look like boys or, or the ponytail, and, and just like North Korea, they have approved hairstyle. Everything has to be approved. So that's how I grew up. I never challenged anything. I was hungry. We had to live on food rationing coupons based on your parents' worker status inside of uh, the state factory. My parents could not get any promotion because they were illiterate. And my dad, even though he was a Communist Party member, but because he was illiterate, he cannot move up. And he was uh, in China that time fighting his Communist Party bosses because they treated him like an animal. Even though he's a worker, supposed to be worker's rule, right? That's what I'm saying to the young people today. They will put you up and sell you something and promise free stuff, and they will never come. And instead, 95% of people, I would say, equally poor and equally enslaved. You want to get some Chinese brand, like a government brand that time? Everything is one brand, detergent, toilet paper. And detergent will take your clothes, brand new clothes color off after first wash. You have no choice of products. But, hey, we should be happy. We should be grateful. That's our indoctrination. Government school tell us every day. So when Mao died, when I was 12, I just could not believe it. I thought he was like a god. At least I never asked a question. I learned a lot to ask a question because they control all the narratives and press. It's extremely political PC environment. The family, neighbors turn against each other, report on each other, and family is supposed to be not loyal to each other. I had to keep my question to myself when he died. Well, who lied to us? Who lied to my generation? Religions all were demonized. I was raised as Buddhist. I could not go to my temples to say, Buddha, bless, bless me. No, you need to turn my mouth bless you. He was talking to me from sky. So when Mao died, I started asking questions. And uh, years later, the party come out to say, Mao is a human being. He made a mistake. 
So it took me years, years to search for truth and to even go to law school in China, want to build a rule of law society. I still love my country. I was a patriot to change China. I was too naive. Once I become faculty member in law school, I realized I better get out of China because they are going to not allow me to live like a a little bit, just a little bit free human being with some dignity, with some privacy. We had the Communist Party committee in every law school, every university department. Even today, Communist Party committee is at every private company over 100 people. Yeah, 100 is magic number. Yeah, it's like this country, right? So, so it's long story short, I finally managed to flee China when I was about 24 years old. To leave law school, I had to get permission to quit my job or I have to pay money back, you know, and then get my passport, seven trips, to have a permission to leave. And I have to become my old straight rat style. Oh yeah, I'm gonna serve my country, I'm gonna go to America to study on my own to get a master's degree in order to be allowed to leave. So it took me 20 years in this free country to get rid of all my indoctrination, to say my own old government lied to me. And I even did not know 40 million people died of starvation because of their central planning policies. I did not know 20 million people died during the Cultural Revolution. It was three years natural disasters people died. So my English got better, I read the books, and my husband, American husband from Texas, taught me well how to speak English and how to read free to choose. The free market capitalism that will enable you to have prosperity. My husband's watching, thank you. Mm -hmm. And anyway, that, uh, but nowadays, nowadays I have been so scared once I wake up. American students don't know what the terms they are using socialism, democratic socialism, equity. I summarized 12 features of most cultural revolution on my Facebook, Lily for Liberty. You can judge yourself. Those 12 features, most tactics, and uh, features are so similar with today. What is it go going on on American soil? Including riots, looting, you know, burning, changing names, Censorship, cancel culture, self-censorship. And the, you can be losing your job and business by your passwords, by your past deeds. And neighbors, families, the division of society, it's very, very scary. That's why I'm so concerned. I feel like I have not done enough in the past four years. I need to do more. That's why I'm here to warn you the mouse cultural revolution seminar style is happening today on American soil. Connect the dots. Look at those 12 features. Critical class theory under Mao. Today is the class critical race theory. But they don't care about your skin color and race. They care about the control and the absolute power and purge political enemies. So we need to go out to wake up people, to collect the dust, especially our young people. We are all Americans, we have so much in common. We don't want to demonize each other, we don't want to be divided, but we want to be unified to say, every man is created equal, right? I achieve American dream by coming here with nothing to start, even could not speak English. I'm living American dream, I'm here talking to you folks, mm -hmm. right? It's like they want to demonize America. They want our kids to hate their ancestors. They want them to say, hey, if you are white, you are racist. I just cannot buy that. Immigrants like me will come out, defend America, defend America, the beautiful, the most exceptional country on earth. There's no place I can go to achieve American dream except in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. And now we turn to Daniel, Daniel Dina Martino. It's, it's hard to follow that. Uh, <laughs> they shouldn't have left me until the end. Okay, okay, let's, let's try. 
Um, well, uh, let me tell you um, about myself, about um, what living in Venezuela is like, what living in Venezuela is like today now that I'm not there too, and what it was in the past. I think that the example of Venezuela is the most relevant example for Americans to learn of a socialist country. And that is because it is the only country, to my knowledge, that has become so totalitarian and it's currently in power, a socialist regime that started democratically. That was not the case in Cuba, that was not the case in the USSR, that was not the case in China, that was not the case in North Korea, which were all violent revolutions where the people had no democratic choice, right? Venezuelans voted for Hugo Chavez, a uh, convicted murderer, by the way, uh, in 1998, who had attempted to gain power violently in 1992 in a coup, was jailed, then pardoned by the following president in a terrible mistake, and then ran for office and won. That's, how, do you, how does that get to happen? And what were the consequences of that? Well, the consequences were that my parents, who owned a gas station in Venezuela, um, was a, imagine like most small business owners in this country, a BP gas station, regular thing. Uh, we were, they were making a few thousand dollars a month like most American middle class families do. Uh, when we went from that to making $2 a day by the year 2016, which is according to the United Nations, the international uh, extreme poverty line. Um, how do you go from that? And imagine if that's what happened to a middle class family, what happened to somebody who made less money before uh, 20 years prior, right? That's why you saw six million of us live in the last five years. Currently, the Venezuelan refugee crisis is about to become the largest refugee crisis in the world, more than the Syrians. Um, and that happened in a country that was democratic, that has the largest oil reserves on the planet, that uh, has gold, uranium, more water you know, available for, per person, and there's no electricity, there's no water in, in, in our homes. Um, Internet is, is extremely bad quality, even though there's still some internet. Um, and, and, and we're becoming like Cuba. Venezuelans who were told that we would never become like Cuba, that, you know, Venezuela is not an island, come on. <laughs> Venezuela has oil, you know, Cuba didn't have oil, of course, oil is gonna protect you. Um, or, you know, we, if, if, if that happens here, how, how could that happen? We're a democracy. Cuba, it was a coup, right? It was a revolution. That cannot happen democratically, a socialist government. Chavez even lied to the population and said, he, I'm not going to nationalize the means of production. I'm not going to take over everything. But we knew he was friends with Fidel Castro. We knew that he was supportive of, of expansive government. And the people who were smart were the people who, who left 20 years ago when he, when he entered power. Every time I meet Venezuelans, I ask, you know, when did you leave? That's the first question. And if they say, oh, yeah, I left uh, 20 years ago, I say, oh, so you were one of the smart ones. <laughs> um, and it's, it's the truth. Um, my, I, I left Venezuela in 2016 after I finished high school. Um, I didn't see a future for myself. Even if I went to college there, um, even if I had gotten a graduate degree in Venezuela, the best I could have hoped for is being able to feed myself and my family. That's it. That, that was the best hope I could achieve. And I didn't want that. And I was fortunate enough that Venezuela was a country that even though it was a socialist totalitarian state, the regime got in power after the internet already existed. So Venezuela is a much more well-connected country and informed than many other totalitarian regimes like Cuba or, or, or even China perhaps. Um, and and I, I saw what the world was like, right? I, as a kid, I had been able to travel to America when my parents were able to afford it. And I knew what the United States was like. And I wanted to be like that. I wanted to live in a place like that. And so I um, learned English. I um, you know, prepared to apply for colleges. I was blessed that, to obtain a scholarship to, to full ride to start in Indiana. And that's how I ended up in Indiana. People always ask me, how did that Venezuelan kid end up in, in Indianapolis? Uh, I had never heard of Indiana before in my life, I must admit. Um, but w it's, it's the state that welcomed me and it's the state that I love the most and I feel like a Hoosier in my heart. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it, is, it, it is a great experience, but it, is, it also taught me many things. When I came to, to America, I saw people who supported the ideas that I had fled from um, in college campuses. 
even professors who challenged me that, I, I, and I can tell you specifically, an English professor challenged me and told me that this was the fault of the United States because of, you know, the typical leftist argument, uh, imperialism and sanctions and all of this. For people who think that the U.S. is imperialist and, and that we need to disengage from the world, they have a very U.S.-centric view to think that everything has to do with the United States outside of this country. That's not the case. <laughs> what happened in Venezuela was not the fault of the United States. It was the fault of the policies implemented by Hugo Chavez, policies such as price controls on absolutely everything that was still privately owned. So while he nationalized many companies, especially the large ones, banks, you know, uh, vast tracts of land, um, the gas station that my parents owned and my parents became employees of the government, uh, living off subsidies, um, there, there were too many private businesses, especially consumer goods, restaurants. And what the government did was that to tame the inflation they created by printing money to pay for government spending, um, you know, they blamed businesses being greedy. Where have I heard that now, right? Uh, now it's inflation, here's the fault of greedy businesses. Um, they blamed that on that, and then they imposed price controls. The government told you as a business owner at how much you could sell everything. Uh, the consequence was shortages. Um, that's what made me want to study economics, right? I was living in an economics 101 lesson. <laughs> price controls create shortages. Uh, printing money to pay for government spending creates inflation. Um, uh, with the lack of private incentives by the government nationalizing things creates what? Uh, a, a failed state-owned enterprise. Um, and, and because of that, um, my mom, who to supplement her income, she started selling chocolates. Uh, she made bonbons for first communions, marriages, baptisms, and mostly religious events. Um, and she she made all this. She's a fantastic cook, by the way. Um, so if she's here, and you know, I'm. Uh, <laughs> the, the the truth is that she had to buy chocolate illegally because it was um, price controlled. And imagine having to hide chocolate inside back as if it was drugs. That's, that's what daily life was like. Um, when I was in school, sometimes my teachers would dismiss class because they found chicken in the supermarket uh, down, down, the, down the few blocks. You know, they had a friend who was a cashier. They texted them, hey, you know, there's toilet paper in the supermarket now. Come over, Maria. And then like, oh, sorry, kids. You know, it's time to dismiss class because we, I have to go buy things for my family. And that's a totally understandable thing to do. But what are the consequences, right? So these ripple down effects. Um, Water sometimes would go out of my apartment for several weeks. We would collect it from the rain. Imagine going from living like an American middle-class family to having to collect water from the rain within a lifetime, within my childhood. That's how fast things happen. Now it's gradual, right? In, you know, 20 years is not an immediate period, but it, it is. It is easily within all of our lifetimes. Um, and so that really affected me and, and made me want to avoid that from ever happening again. I started economics. Uh, that's why I'm doing a PhD in economics. I know that the previous panel was about education. And I do think that that's how we change things. I think that the reason that Venezuela became the way it became initially through democratic means, then, of course, totally totalitarian. Now the Venezuelan people don't support what's going on. Um, was because the, the, the regime they were able to sow envy in the population. Envy from the rich that we had to take from the capitalists to give to the poor, right? That, that was the fault of the rich, that they were poor. Um, they, they were able to, to, to sow that hate and, and that envy, and that's where socialism comes from. Envy is a natural feeling, you know? This, this, that's why it's one of the capital sins, and it's one that we have to fight, uh, and, and one that, that Jesus taught us to fight. We, we don't we can't teach our kids to, to be envious. We have to teach them to the opposite, to admire success and to be successful themselves. And I think that that's something that America has always been very successful at, right? That's why there's such a culture of entrepreneurship in this country. And that's why the left in this country has resorted to other division tactics, not just class, but race and gender as well. And, it, and it's, it's just a, a different version of, of a class warfare. It's a race warfare, it's a gender warfare, it's whatever has to be done and lied to, to divide the population and conquer. Um, I think that most, yes, of course, you know, schools can, can change things and we, and we should do that, but really most of it comes from the family. 
Um, I think that parents, I, I was very fortunate that despite all the bad things that I went through in Venezuela, I had a fantastic family that taught me well. And um, I think that if parents take over value lessons for their children and not just leave it exported, you know, outsource it to the schools, then we can actually change that. Imagine if all conservatives did that. If all conservatives did that with their children, we would have no problems in this country at all. But the truth is that the children of conservative Americans are becoming socialists. And I've had many concerned parents come to me and ask me, how do I stop this? And I, and I, and I sympathize. And yes, it's teaching the stories. It's giving them the resources. It's talking about politics in class, in, 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 in the dinner table. Many, many parents are like, you know, I, we don't talk about politics at the dinner table. No. That, that cannot ever happen again. We have to talk about politics at the dinner table with, your, with, with children. Um, I, I, I know in my family we always did, right? Because we live in a totalitarian regime, so we all hated the government, and you just got uh, you know, in, into that um, state of thinking. Something I want to leave you with uh, that I think is it's very important before we go into the Q&A is that I, I've always thought of America as, as a nation that is based on ideas, and it's uh, the ideas of freedom. It's an open, free, and tolerant society. For that to be the case, Americans have to be able to, to be free to choose between bad and good, between evil and good. But the truth is that, yes, Americans are free to choose now, but they're not informed on that choice. Americans are not informed into what's evil and what's good. And that's our, that's our task here. Yes, we cannot force people into not being socialist. We cannot you know, predetermine political outcomes. We will always be a democracy. But we have to be able to teach people what's good and what's bad. And that's our task at hand. And I think that we can achieve it with our stories. We can achieve it with our families. And sometimes not everything is about the government. A lot of it is about our own individual action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'd like to open it up immediately to questions because I, I heard some comments already from the audience. So please uh, raise your hand and, and let's uh, have some discussion. Yes, sir. Say, I've heard a few of you referring to, uh, I think we need to simplify it in that um, you know, it's the battle of good and evil, and I've come to see that. I didn't grow up with that, and the human nature, and uh, especially a couple of young people that was up there earlier. That's all. Um, I, if I, I, I want to follow up. Yes, it's a battle of good and evil, and something I didn't mention, but that it's important. This is an international battle. This is not just a battle in the United States, and these, the things that happen abroad affect us. And the things that happen in America affect the rest of the world. Um, you know, the, the Venezuelan regime, the Cuban regime, Rosa Maria Payat talked about this, that what's happening in Venezuela wouldn't be happening if Cuba hadn't become a socialist state. I don't know if you know this, but Cuba tried to invade Venezuela in the 1960s. Um, and and the, the reason they got expelled from the Organization of American States was not because Castro took over Cuba, but it was actually because the Venezuelan government requested their, their expulsion. Um, and so the, the Cubans have been trying to take control of Venezuela for a very long time. Why? Because of the oil industry, because they want free oil. That's how they maintain their parasitic economy, just like now we're parasites ourselves. Um, and, and other parts of Latin America are falling into that. You know, Peru now has a president that is a self about Maoist. Uh, Argentina is under the same crooked regime of, the Fer of Fernandez and the Kitchener. Um, the, Chile has a presidential election soon. Um, Brazil, you know, may the, the Lula may get back into power. In Colombia, we may lose the most important U.S. ally in the region to Petro, a, a friend of Maduro. Uh, we have that not just in Latin America, but in the rest of the world. In Europe, the vice president of Spain until recently was Pablo Iglesias, who was a contractor for Hugo Chavez and got paid five million euros, who has a shirt of him. He was the vice president of Spain, a European country, a U.S. ally, a NATO member. That's, that's happening without us doing anything about it. We need, as the United States of America, to understand that if we are the only island of freedom left in the world, we're not going to be able to survive. We need to support our allies around the world to keep them free. Well, the thing is, uh, when you talk about how to teach good versus evil, but what if our youth indoctrinated in schools, they even don't understand what 
what the evil is. Uh, you write when nuts, extremists, insurrections are the evils in their eyes. How do they know? Communism is evil, socialism kills. And uh, I have been saying for years, conservatives have left classrooms to be dominated by Marxist radical left. If the teachers are brainwashed by their Marxist professors, which is leftists, like we are 80, 90% of professors, how do they teach our children about the good and evil? It's a parent's job. It's also the, um, us as people who understand good and evil to say, we need more of us to be teachers and to have school choice, to have freedom education account, and to have a dialogue with, with our students. Um, why would we even let the cultural wars dominated by the Marxists? The founding fu um, founders of um, BLM said, we are trained Marxist, Marxists. And we had the Chinese CCP founded Confucius Institute in our country for 15 years until just been last year. How did this happen? And uh, I just don't get it. That's why I feel like we have to be some doing something different. We cannot just preach to the choir ourselves. We have to go out. We have to use social media. We have to get into art, culture, Hollywood, movies, comedies, and the social media YouTubers. There are lots of YouTubers are funded by CCP money. Are you aware of that? They glorify China. So that's why our kids, you know, think CCP is doing a pretty good job. Build the largest second e economy in the world. Is that uh, the truth or not? So I think we have to really take back our classrooms and this anti-critical race theory movement is growing. Parents are passionate and parents are running for school board, uh, taking over their classrooms. I think that's where the frontline battle is today, is in our classrooms. That's how I see it. Thank you. When uh, when Rosa Maria Pio was speaking, I heard the strains of a song in my head, and that is the song Patria e Vida. Uh, and it is a short song. It's well worth uh, looking up on YouTube if you haven't uh, listened and watched it yet and be part of the millions of hits. Um, but it encapsulates in one song uh, the the message that you're talking about, that you want to be able to teach about good versus evil, what form of government that's in that song, uh, it's, car it's culture, it's art, it's music. Uh, and this is, this is just one thing that is reaching many people to, to educate them, to tell them um, about what the stakes are uh, and what, uh, what people won't stand for anymore in Cuba. So it's actually a particular song with a universal message. And so it's an example of something that we need to be doing a lot of. Um, another question? Yes, sir. Afternoon. It's been very, very informative, and I've really enjoyed it. My name is Chris Cloud. My wife, Debbie, and I have American Life and Liberty out in Marshall, Virginia. And um, the earlier panel was mentioned something that, that I wanted to touch on. and. Um, they were talking about, I guess, the difference between Marxism or communism versus capitalism, and, and it, it strikes me as a attraction rather than promotion. Um, the the capitalist ideal and the, Mer the, the American ideal of freedom, we promote that via attraction. And the alternative, the opposition, as I call it, acts under promotion or aggression aggression and, and um, uh, action. And um, I think that I, I've long held this idea that conservatives have an obligation to define the envelope that the liberal pushes against. And unfortunately for the last several generations, the young lady over here that was up on stage earlier was talking about the, the generational differences. Um, I fear that conservatives have, have been negligent in their obligation to be the uh, the the limits or the boundaries. There's got to be yin and yang. There's got to be a liberal, um, uh, creative mind uh, up against a conservative, um, you know, factual mind. And we have, as conservatives, been negligent in our side of that equation uh, to our detriment. 
Um, what, what I would say, I think to your point, is that we are always pushing back rather than pushing forward, right? You know, and, and I think it's 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 part of you know how to sell to voters. Uh, voters have these concerns about the cost of education, about the cost of housing, the cost of healthcare, um, about um, you know edu uh, in general things of everyday life. And you don't see many conservative solutions that are about you know how to reduce the cost of education or how to reduce the cost of healthcare. You know we couldn't even get agree on it when we had uh, the, the power to to do so. So w when you see that, you do know very clearly what are the solutions of the left, right? Everybody knows it's Medicare for all. Everybody knows it's for giving all student debt and giving everything you know for free. Everybody knows the solutions of the. Bernie Sanders wants to keep public housing for everybody now. Um, so. If we don't come up with sol free market solutions, then it's we, we are always in, in the losing side. That's that's my my point of view, and and we need. Uh, I think that Newt Gingrich uh, did a very good job in the '90s with uh, the agenda for America. That he actually had a conservative agenda that people were voting for. That people knew what was the alternative, and we don't have that anymore. Yeah, we also need uh, to keep in mind that. Uh, they, our kids have the American rights and the freedom to sit down in their cushy, nice chairs and hold their cell phone to demonize capitalism. And they are the beneficiaries of a free market economy to give them plenty of products to choose from. But they just don't know economics 101 because they don't teach them in public schools. They teach them to be social justice warriors, like the Cultural Revolution Red Guards. You know, that's what I'm saying, that we got to figure something more effective. How many conservative voices on TikTok? How many conservative voices on Instagram? Uh, uh, you know, all that young people gathering millions and millions. And when we want to share something from Epic Times, we get shadow banned, very few likes, because people say, conservative will say, well, the private companies, they can do whatever they want. Well, I want to remind you, Xinhua News Agency, is a private, was private company before the Communist Party take over funded PRC in 1949. So now the CCP has existed for a hundred years. And the Xinhua News Agency is the largest propaganda machine in the whole world. How do you explain that the Xinhua News, C News Agency as a private organization back then in the 20s in China well, can do whatever they wanted without challenge? And they just become literally Chinese described is the mouth and the throat of the party. You know, you know 1984. So if they control the, the narrative, they control the talking points, they censor dissent and voices, we cannot even get the voices out. That's why we're not effective. So I will encourage you to go out and, and we cannot demonize anybody who disagrees with us. So we have to let a uh, hundred flowers flourish, like a uh, my mouth said, right? <laughs> and then later he threw them to the concentration camps. But uh, really, university is supposed to be free idea exchange, vigorous re debate about what kind of country, what kind of solution we should have. But now they're chanting, the real solution is a communist revolution. How sad that is to me, and the immigrants like us, we heard all this before. Now it's happening right in front of our eyes. So, you know, it's, it's very, very concerning. Uh, let me, oh, no, that was, that was a question. Yes. I've heard people mentioning public schools, but there was recently, well, it actually, it really started with the universities almost 100 years ago. Frankfurt School set up shop at Columbia University. And that's actually what they said they wanted to go, go through academia to, to undermine this country. And, uh, but even in these private schools, there was, this, I don't remember the name of it because I never heard of it. It was a $65,000 a year uh, grade, I think it was a grade school level school in New York City. Um, and, you know, they were constantly teaching if you were white, you know, and probably most of the people there were white or maybe they were Jewish. But um, they were just constantly telling you if you're white, you're bad. And, and now they're going after Asians, this term people of color which I guess is the new way of saying colored yes, people. Yes, we're white now. They will, we're say, white. they will say people of color, but not Asian. And, um, but you have to be concerned about these, these private schools. These, these Jesuit universities, I've been reading horrible things. That almost every Catholic university, unfortunately, is run by Jesuits. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm Catholic, um, and uh, I'll say that it's true that many Catholic universities in this country are, not, are really Catholic in name only. 
um, uh, you know, if, if we really go into it, right? Um, you know, they're not, not actually teaching religion and they're like actually promoting abortion. <laughs> like you're certainly not, not Catholic if you do that. Um, I will say this, yes, universities are stacked against us, but it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You think they're stacked against you, so you don't go into the academia, and therefore it becomes stacked against you. Uh, that's one of the reasons I decided to do a PhD, because I want to become a college professor in economics. And I think okay. that the only way for us to change things is by us, you know, a lot of us stepping up and doing it. And yes, it's a challenge. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I'm the only conservative. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like very conservative. Yes, the only one. Um, but, you know, somebody has to do it. And I think that more more young people should should be considering academia as a career option. If if there was a tsunami of applications, <laughs> you know, imagine what we could change. And that just takes individual action. Um, so that's that's one thing. Another thing, and I'll say this to also give hope. I, last week, I participated in a debate in the University of Columbia that was hosted by like a bunch of uh, political organizations, college Republicans, college Democrats, um, the Columbia Political Union, and it was the resolution was resolved that the U.S. is a good force in the world. That's controversial nowadays in college campuses, right? And I went to debate the affirmative, and to my surprise, look. I mean, I lost the debate. Um, I lost the debate, you know, after the vote of the students. But I lost it by one vote. Black eye. Yeah. <laughs> I, I lost it by one vote. If you could, uh, out of 50, you know, out of 50, you know, uh, 49, 25 to 24, if you can get that at Columbia University, you can get 90% of the United States of America. That's how I see it. Right, right. Uh, and so, <laughs> and so, what's, right, you know, it's okay. Um, the, the point is that we need more conservatives to step up and do things that in some ways are risky now because the, it will be much riskier in the future if we don't fight now, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine doing that in Venezuela or in China, and by the point that you want to do it there, it's too late. Well, because what you say, Daniel, get your left professor to debate me. <laughs> I would love to do that, but nobody invited me yet. Yeah. And also, there is a communist professor on the, from the riverside in California. So me and my Chinese uh, immigrant friend, uh, um, we both were after him on Twitter. He has 33,000 <laughs> followers. He called himself Karl Marx. And uh, I, you know, it's like, uh, hey, people paid by taxpayers' money and, uh, you know, um, trying to be a communist. is uh, so easy to be communist in a free country instead of capitalist in a communist country. You go disappear, you know? That's the communist uh, textbook. So I remember a few years ago, I read about the Justice Democrats in New York City, a communist group recruited a squad to run for office. And I also read that they wanted to encourage their people to go to become public school teachers. Those were all were red flags. Why they think become public school teachers? Because, just like Chairman Mao said, a young people's mind is a piece of a blank paper can draw the most beautiful pictures. You control youth might, you control country's future. So we need to get into classrooms, as I said, also fight the cultural wars and get into social media. If you're upset, you leave Facebook, you leave Twitter, you're not effective because lots of people who include independents, they are there. That's why I'm gonna try to be there as long as I can. And I have to be strategic, use my language so I don't get canceled or censored, right? But we have to <laughs> stay there because that's how you get you get our use. So hopefully we will figure out an uh, effective ways. And please, I would love to go to Columbia University. <laughs> yes. <laughs> please join me in thanking our panelists and uh, heroes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. and insightful remarks about the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was truly the evil empire. We have heard disturbing remarks about some of the current challenges from Marxism, 
unfortunately and unbelievably even here at home. And we have heard eloquent testimonies from witnesses, from survivors, who fight for the freedom of their homelands that are under communist domination and who do not want anything to take away the freedom of their adoptive homeland, America. But this is all largely for naught unless we transmit the facts and lessons to millennials, Gen Z, and generations to come after them. Indeed, we need to do remedial education for some in older generations too, but we will take it as a victory if we can reach the next generations. What that means is we must remember and pass on key points from today. Marxism was and is a bad theory. It was and is based on wrong pseudoscientific, socio-political, economic ideas, an erroneous view of human nature, a faulty understanding of politics and history, and rejection of the transcendent. This theory immediately requires an equally flawed plan of action. As a result, communism made and makes for a horrible system in practice. It is not something to keep trying since, as the canard goes, it just has not been done correctly to date. And time and again, communism was and is imposed on people. It was and is not freely chosen or elected under open and honest circumstances. Communism is the ultimate one-party, state-controlled, atheistic, centralized regime that crushes the individual and his rights, the family, the community, and the common good. What do we need to do? Well, everything that we've heard today Many things, right? But I would highlight two essentials. The first essential, education. Full education is needed in the classroom, in families and communities, and here, desperately, in the nation's capital, as well as in state and local governments. This education must be accurate and compelling. This education must tell the whole story. Although our focus today is on the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union and some key current challenges, we need rising generations to understand the history of communism and the victims it made from the start. Students and young people in general should leave a program like this one saying out loud, indeed loudly, louder than Lily Tang Williams. I do not want that kind of government. I do not want that life. And we should communicate the story not only chronologically, but also thematically. In the Victims of Communism Museum, which VOC will open next year here in Washington, DC, that is intentionally our approach. We are layering the concepts, oppression, crimes, and more that were and are characteristic across communist regimes on the chronology. All this created and creates victims again and again. It also sparked and sparks, time and again, heroic resistance. We want visitors, especially the next generations, to understand when, where, who, what, and why. The second essential, witness testimonies. We need as many witness stories as possible. We have seen and heard here at this conference the power of eyewitnesses. All of today's witnesses are moving, persuasive speakers who educate VOC audiences and others. There should be many more witnesses and many more audiences. And we've heard this today, remember the Holocaust survivors. They went into schools and communities. 
Their stories are preserved, notably at the U.S. Holocaust Museum and in its programs. As we get farther into the 21st century, though, many of these survivors have passed away. With communism survivors, great numbers, as we now know, over 100 million are also no longer with us. But there are still many stories to hear and collect from the living. There is an urgency. These stories beg to be told in person. And then the testimonies should be preserved in multimedia form, along with artifacts, if witnesses have those to share. Pulling together these two essential areas, we also need to use different formats for telling the truth. VOC strives to lead in this area and invites others to join us. We are currently working on our newest expanded edition of curricula for educators to use in teaching the next generations. VOC is also expanding its Witness Project video series. Transmitting the lessons to the next generations will, of course, require a commitment from all concerned. We also need, as we've heard today, books, articles, short and long form fiction based on the history, documentaries, podcasts, movies and series, all kinds. There is not an end of stories to tell. Clips and programs on YouTube and content and comments throughout social media. As they learn and reject the horrors of communism, students and young people in general should be inspired by those who said and say no to communism and along with them fight for freedom every day in small and large ways. On behalf of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, I thank the Heritage Foundation for joining with us. And we invite all of you, in person and virtually, to join us in the crucial task of teaching the truth about communism, its history, its crimes, its villains, and the heroes in the fight against it to the next generations. Thank you very much. of the millions who watched their children starve or who received that knock on the door in the middle of the night to have a husband or a wife taken away by secret police and for all those who were tortured and who suffered and lived in poverty and misery, I thank all of you for being here. 